Hello, hello. Off we go again. Oh, I hope you're so full and you've had such good conversation on design and life and emotion and past mistakes and future mistakes and all sorts. <laughs> this is my way of trying to get people inside for a delicious latter half of this feast that we've had today. Now is time to enjoy, really. We're starting what is the third session of the day. And as before, we ask the question, what now? And in this chapter, we'll talk about this little thing called life. How can we design health, happiness, inclusion, healing, dignity, and justice? Things we now know are among the most important in life. Something we might have relearned after the pandemic, or during it even. In this session, we'll hear from Sigurdur Thorstensson, designer, partner at Design Group Italia, and brand strategy director at the Blue Lagoon. We'll hear from Thikyo, a local interdisciplinary design project for children and their families, and Lee Baker, co-founder of Graphic Rewilding, a provocative art initiative that proposes to hack our happiness. That will be interesting. But we start with Peter Venstra. He's a landscape architect and a co-founder at Lola Landscape Architects in the Netherlands. Peter works on topics he feels deserve more attention in the field of all architecture. For example, post-disaster landscapes, afforestation and climate adaptation in the urban environment. So I shall now welcome him to the stage. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here and to show the work uh, of our studio. We are based in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, and with a group of uh, 40 people, we work on public spaces and landscapes on various skills. Um, this gives an impression. Um, some projects we are currently working on are uh, this one. It's uh, design of public space of the largest car-free neighborhood of uh, the Netherlands. Um, we are planning new forests to uh, sequester carbon and also create climate refuges. Uh, we are actually right now working on uh, the dismantling of an oil refinery in Portugal uh, to give a second life to this uh, space. And we are uh, also advising on nature inclusiveness uh, on, in all different spaces, among which uh, advising airports how to rewild and to become even bird inclusive. And um, we are also on a regional scale thinking of how to uh, restore natural uh, systems like this water system here related to land use to prepare for climate change. We also organize uh, exhibitions. Uh, last year we co-curated the Rotterdam Architectural Biennale. Uh, that was all about um, the overshoot of planetary boundaries and how the design community can contribute to this. Uh, the carbon problem we spoke about before, the loss of biodiversity, uh, but also the polluting of our soils and the depletion of our water systems. Um, we gathered best practices from all over the world, um, projects we believed in, practices we believed in, and we recognized three fundamental different attitudes to successfully engage with climate change. Um, and that's the activist, the ancestor, and the accelerator. Um, where the ac activist lives in the here and now and, and sort of re revolts against the system and works with uh, direct interventions, the ancestor takes a step back and zooms out in scale and in time and fundamentally rethinks the way we live. and. Um, the accelerator um, embraces our high-tech society and uses actually um, innovation to scale up and accelerate um, the good work, let's say. And it is, um, we are convinced that uh, there should be no discussion about which uh, approach is better, uh, but all three are needed and need to run in parallel uh, in the same direction uh, to make the best possible uh, impact. Um, but we were also really convinced that uh, designers should not 
forget to talk about design. Um, it's very tempting to talk about problems and solutions, but in the end, nobody wants to live in the solution of a problem. Um, we also know that um, with pure technological solutions, we won't manage to become carbon or climate neutral. And we need to also change our lifestyle, uh, the way we live, work, um, uh, the way we, what we consume, what we eat. And it's up to designers and architects to build the environments that encourage this new uh, sustainable lifestyle. Well, this is also the philosophy of our uh, uh, practice, our office. Uh, for today, these are big topics. Um, I brought three small projects to explain a little further. Um, the first project uh, is uh, perhaps the smallest we ever did. It's an installation in a museum in the Netherlands. Uh, and um, it was an exhibition on paradise. And we were asked to do a centerpiece there. And the question was asked to us, what is your version of contemporary paradise? And for better or for worse, um, we wanted to give a positive answer to this. And we started with the history of paradise. And um, we could see that um, somehow the concept of paradise had always, has always been about abundance. Um, and while society was changing, also um, uh, that, that uh, version of paradise was changing. Um, in sort of early agricultural society, um, that was lacking sometimes food and safety. Paradise was all about abundance of food and safety. Um, the paradise garden in Islamic cultures, in drier, uh, uh, in drier, drier climates, was all about the abundance of water. And in modern society, where most people have an office job, the holiday paradise is an abundance of sun and warmth. And um, we were, were thinking, what is the next step here? Um, and also seeing the problem of this, because this culture of abundance is perhaps also what brought us to this overshoot of uh, planetary boundaries. So can we come up with what would be the sustainable alternative? Uh, and when thinking about that, I uh, bumped into uh, this guy. Um, this was on my uh, way from work to home. And I thought, yes, that man, he found paradise. Uh, not uh, by taking a flight uh, 10,000 kilometers, but just by finding it 100 meters from his uh, uh, door. Um, this man is owning it. Uh, and this is one of the uh, central spots of Rotterdam. This is right next to Central Station. Um, you can see in the backgrounds, you see the, the taxis dropping off passengers. Um, he changed his mindset and just uh, found it around the corner. And we thought this is a fantastic message that we should no longer look for some inclusive, exclusive, far away paradise, but see if we can create it just around the corner. Um, this requires something from the public space we live in. Uh, it needs more beauty, perhaps not the, the far away beauty, the, the stunning uh, real landscapes, but Maybe it's just a microdose of what you could see there injected into our daily public spaces. For this project, we um, found inspiration in almost a global movement of uh, people, residents, greening the streets and um, taking out tiles, planting trees, often very vulnerable projects if you see them. But all together, all around the world, it's almost like a force of nature that pulls up the, the paving uh, to let the green come out. And when we were thinking about this project, um, also the eruption in La Palma was taking place. And somehow, I was also fascinated by the brutal nature force. And um, in the end, we did a proposal to combine those two and to create sort of quite literal eruption of green coming through the pavement. Um, it was a very last minute idea and I sketched it while driving to the, uh, uh, the museum um, and credits for the museum director to recognize the potential of this, uh, uh, this uh, sketch. Um, and this is, uh, this is how we started to build it. It was on a beautiful wooden floor, so first we needed to protect that from being damaged. 
Um, and we really wanted to bring out the real city into the museum uh, and to work with the typical standard 30 by 30 tile that is used on all sidewalks in the Netherlands. It's all second hand coming from a, a, a stock uh, in, in the same city. And here we are slowly building up this uh, floor and building up the volcano, the eruption, um, where the plants are uh, popping out. There are the plants coming. Um, th these were all donated afterwards to the local zoo. Uh, and this is the end result. Uh, so, so the uh, literal bump. And we wanted this eruption to look as real as possible and also the plants to look as lush as, uh, as possible, as a sort of a monument, small temporary monument for uh, all those people that are putting their energy into greening the city. Now for the second project, um, I would like to first say a bit more about our practice and where we are coming from. Um, what we do is very much rooted in our love-hate relationship with the Dutch landscape. Um, the Dutch landscape is completely rationalized. All wilderness has been pushed out. It's an agricultural country and um, even all the agriculture has been uh, modernized uh, to optimize it for uh, machines. Here you can see the same uh, uh, crop of the map in two different time frames, um, sort of pre-modern landscape and on the right side, uh, completely rationalized, history erased. This happened all over the Netherlands. Here you see another example, uh, physically next to each other, the old polar structure and the new one. Um, and this very open, linear and uh, rectangular landscape then was the only thing we had. And when um, designing urban expansions, often this landscape was taken as an inspiration um, and led to also very linear and, and repetitive uh, uh, suburbs. This is where we grew up and we felt that as uh, uh, landscape designers, we shouldn't just continue this, but we should try to find the opportunity to bring back a bit of that wilderness, a bit of real nature into this artificial uh, uh, landscape. Um, we felt that the country had lost qualities uh, and that we wanted to bring back. Um, to bring back nature, not just as a place of ecology, uh, but also a place for people to reconnect to nature, to reconnect to the senses, to the soil and to history. Um, now this is an early project we did, it's a bit more experimental, it's called Composed City and it's all about uh, sensory experience. Um, it's a installation, permanent installation that we added to a public park in uh, Belgium. And we took um, as a starting point the typical Dutch phenomenon of the grid forest uh, plantation. And we found a way to shake it, uh, to shake it, to enjoy actually the sound of the leaves. Um, if you pay attention to it, um, the sound of nature is beautiful. And um, if you, um, in the end, how we experience uh, public space is partially on base of what we see, but this is also partially on base of what we hear. And as designers, we always focus on the visual part, and we felt that it was, uh, let's say, the auditive uh, quality of, uh, of a landscape was uh, very much uh, neglected. So we wanted to do something with that and to make uh, uh, an installation um, that takes this nature and makes an instrument out of it. Um, what we did was installing uh, shakers into trees, wire them all to a computer and to an interface, and uh, via that uh, run different sort of uh, shaking uh, patterns uh, through this uh, small uh, grid forest. So we started with uh, 24 birch trees, as you can see here aligned in a grid um, within the center, um, uh, this interface. Um, the tree shaker looked like this, so it was a motor with a pendulum that was swinging and then with that shaking the tree, uh, screwed it into the stem of the tree. Um, and this is the central console. Uh, there is a phone number that you can dial 
and then you get a choosing menu and you can choose uh, uh, 10 different patterns that then is activated in this uh, small forest. And here you see just a snippet of, let's say, that uh, in action. Um, it's uh, already there for almost uh, 10 years and it's still uh, um, working. You can still visit it in, in Belgium. In the end, it was uh, maybe not shaking, but more shivering. And also, if you're there, that's also the feeling you get yourself. Um, and the nice thing is that we really got a lot of positive comments that people started to really listen differently to um, the natural environment and pay attention to that. And also in our projects that we do, we always select our trees also for their acoustic quality um, to really make this part of the, of the design. Um, very unintended by us, but in the end, I think beautiful. Uh, someone came up with the idea to activate this installation after a night of snow. Um, creating a sort of mini avalanche uh, in, uh, in uh, Belgium. A last project that I would want to show is all about um, connecting to the soil and connecting to uh, history. And it's an archaeology garden uh, project that we uh, finished a year ago in the south of the Netherlands. Um, on this location, very rural, very peripheral, um, that was special for one reason. Um, back in history, this might have been there, a fortress protecting a small hamlet. Um, this was a suspicion based on what was drawn on several historic maps. And the project started with the idea of combining, let's say, bringing back that history to attract uh, regional tourism, um, to dig out the canals to create a water buffer to solve a local flooding problem, um, to reveal the, as much as possible the, the foundations of this, uh, of this uh, tower uh, that had been there, and to then plant a, a castle garden uh, publicly accessible. That was the idea of the project. And it started with archeological research, fascinating to see. Uh, and these archeologists created this map of the location, trying to allocate the historical layers. You can see the trenches that they have been digging, um, and the dots that you see there are the objects they found. Uh, from all different centuries, they found uh, uh, different things. The only thing is that they found, they didn't find a single thing of this former castle. So probably there was no former castle, uh, and that took a bit by the reason out of the, the project. And then we said, okay, let's forget about the castle. Let's make a garden that's completely about archaeology and is search for uh, history. And so we decided to collaborate with the archaeologists uh, to form a team. In the end, spending half of the construction budget on additional research uh, by the archaeologists and to create a composition of trenches, of research trenches, um, that then would be dug by these archeo uh, archaeologists. And our idea was, let's, let's do more research, find more objects. Then, when the research has been done, cover them with garden strips and select the most valuable objects found and present them right above the uh, place where they have been found to create a very direct relationship between the object and the space. Um, that was the project, and uh, that's what we started to do. So this was the second round of archaeological research. Um, we also organized open days where the archaeologists were explaining what they found to uh, the locals. Very interesting. And in the end, this digging was a bit more messy than we uh, anticipated, because these archaeologists, um, in the end, also uh, sometimes uh, changed plans because they saw something interesting on the right side. Uh, sometimes a wall collapsed. Um, so here you see in red what was actually dug um, and in gray what we had, uh, had planned. Um, what we thought was interesting to stay very close to the factual process and to actually formalize what they have been dug, uh, digging uh, into the final plan. So we incorporated that irregularity into the uh, final design of this uh, garden. Um, then we started selecting the, the objects that they found. 
and um, of course we were looking for the most attractive shapes that were there, um, but also uh, objects with a story. It could tell a bit about the, the life that uh, took place there once. We couldn't put, uh, use the originals, but we, uh, um, in the end, uh, used copies, uh, 3D scanned and 3D printed copies of these objects and put them on a stick uh, um, exactly on the location where they were found. Um, here we see the project uh, or the, the, the land just after it was uh, finished in the first year with temporary planting uh, to prevent weeds from coming up and here the permanent planting being installed. We collaborated with Piet Oudolf, plant designer that specialized in creating sort of very seasonal planting that's attractive in all seasons of the year. Um, and this was the end result. So here we see it a bit from a bird's eye perspective. Um, first year uh, garden in autumn with beautiful brown tones of the, of the planting. And then the next summer with more blossoming uh, flowers. Um, you can also see the objects uh, almost like black flowers popping out of this uh, vegetation. And for each of the objects we also had a number and this was uh, linked to a central information panel where you could read about uh, the, the date that probably that object was uh, produced um, and also what it was used for. Some more photos. Um, because not the whole garden was actually publicly accessible, some of these findings could not be presented exactly where they were found. And we decided to also create a table where we gathered, let's say, uh, all the uh, objects that we could not present in these uh, original trenches. And this is the information panel. Uh, and we found that, especially for kids, it was a very nice uh, game to, let's say, run to one of the objects and then to run back to the information panel to understand what it uh, actually was. Um, it was a very remote location. Uh, in a very rural setting, and, um, but what was interesting is that not after the opening, um, a group of locals stood up and gathered to uh, actually take care of the uh, maintenance of this garden. Um, so it was really bringing people together and also it was now, it's being used as a yearly place for uh, concerts and, and events. So it really added a social uh, a hotspot to this uh, local community. Uh, and this is how we like to see projects after we are done. It's only the start of the life of the project that is then adopted by the people that live there and are also uh, slowly changing and coloring uh, that space. These were three projects. Um, I'm aware that they're, they're all very much, let's say, rooted in a very different environment. Um, Back to Iceland, the question is how relevant this is for the, the context we have here with the climate conditions we have here. I was discussing this with one of the uh, people of the organization and then she sent me uh, this uh, text dialogue between nature and an Icelander. It's, it's already 200 years old. And it's basically a story of an Icelander fleeing the harsh uh, landscape of Iceland to find a, a comfortable uh, landscape elsewhere, which led to a sort of lifelong uh, uh, journey over the world to end up somewhere in Africa to get eaten by a lion. That's the end of the story. Um, and she said, perhaps the, the landscape of Iceland is too harsh uh, for this. Um, maybe, maybe not. That's uh, an open question. I'd like to think that also these ideas and ideals uh, would be possible to apply in this uh, context of uh, Reykjavik, perhaps in a very different way. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Are you going to uh, take seats, any seats? Uh, thanks, Peter. We're going to have a quick conversation about Peter's work and the context of Iceland and uh, the Netherlands, but first we're going to have a first going to introduce um, Borghilda Stoludotter, uh, who is the head of local planning uh, here in Reykjavik. She's going to introduce herself, uh, explain a bit about what she does, and then we're going to have a conversation between the three of us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, 
not about not, not so much about what I do, but I just want to um, take you through uh, some um, some thoughts, so we can have a. But it's a it's a good thing to uh, know that you uh, you are working with uh, with uh, you know when you're digging and when you're cutting and looking at the history because now I will. Why doesn't it uh, start? Uh, it's here on the screen, but it's not up there. Okay, he's working on it. Do you want to make a joke? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, my mic's not on. So. <laughs> 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 Because what the first slide I wanted to show you, and probably will be here soon, is exactly about the timeline and uh, where we are from, and maybe in a way where we are heading. Because uh, our timeline is so short. You know, like we were talking about before, when we saw the 66 uh, North, it has been about surviving, not about living in a way, but just surviving this island. And um, is it coming? Do you think so? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's for, for like, because we were talking about ancestors before, but it's like, it's, it's just my grandmother and grandfather. The timeline is so short. And if I want to have stories of them from before, it is how they were surviving, not about how they were living. It's just trying to survive all the time. So, uh, ah, here we go. You know, my, uh, my grandmother was born in a, a turf house, and this was the barracks many Reykjavik, citizens of Reykjavik lived in after the war. So, and this feels like a little bit yesterday, because when you say centuries ago or something, that's like, this is just the last century with us. So we have to have this, this in mind when we're talking about urban planning and, 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 and thriving in the city. This is the city 80 years ago, in a way. And this is the city today. This is 80 years in between. That's nothing. So I just want to emphasize that because this is what we are doing today. We are demolishing houses to start all over again. In, instead of trying to have a timeline that makes sense. Not loving our houses enough, in a way. It's too easy to tear down and start all over again. And uh, just a short, but this, is, this in the way is, um, you know, pools are our uh, basic public infrastructure in, in Iceland. And uh, this is, I think, our greatest achievement when it comes to infrastructure in a way, where we meet, where we talk, where we are almost naked together in a hot water, talking about the weather, not be eaten by a lion. You know, th this is where we are together at our best. And th therefore, here we have to address the word politics, because politics in a way is the way we, uh, we um, are uh, trying to help one another to, to make decisions about how to spend money, how to survive, how to make a living. And it's not for the politicians to talk about, it's for us. It's the most dangerous thing is to, to leave it to the politicians, it's us to discuss in a way. So um, politics are infrastructure and uh, urban structure and architecture at its best. So I think that's the word we also have to address when we're talking about what next. So that's it. Take a seat, probably this one. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, super interesting um, well, presentations by both. Um, so the, to start with you, Peter, the three, four, maybe if we count the car free city, uh, very varied projects, um, kind of car-free city, a kind of an explosion of plants, a kind of archaeological dig. What's the kind of core thread that connects those? I would say it's it's sort of seeing public space as a sort of endless reservoir of possibilities, okay. and, um, and 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 we see it as our job to discover what's there, what's the potential of it, 
and to share that with the people that eventually uh, make use of it. And um, um, I think public space is incredibly important for the functioning of, of a city um, where people meet, um, get uh, out of their loneliness. Um, the more time they spend in public space, the less time they need to spend in private space. Um, the, the more you share, the less you need to own, perhaps. And um, so, so it's, it's very important, and it's also very important that it's versatile, that, that somehow is not one type of public space, but that there is public space for all the different needs that you have and all the different emotions that you have, mm -hmm. moments of the year, moments of the day. Um, so that's a bit uh, how, we, how we look at it. And so people, you mentioned the word people, people a lot there. <laughs> is there yeah. people the core, <laughs> the core importance? Yeah. Like making sure that spaces work for people. And I suppose that nicely ties on to um, what you're doing in Reykjavik and this point in the pools being kind of a place where people gather. Um, obviously, my understanding, and I'm no expert, is most of those pools are kind of legacy, kind of 60s, 70s, kind of. So is that what is, what's happening now to bring people together in the city? Um, I, I just think, uh, of course, it's, it's, it has been a, a very uh, uh, cherished culture, you know, it's where we meet and yeah, we, where mm. people have their own, uh, not just the private, but where they meet people together and, and you know, the hot tubs, they mm. are usually around, it's our way of thinking that we have a conversation, mm. you know, eye to eye. But uh, I think, I'm not sure if I can say that COVID has taught us, but, but at least we know now what it means to have the, have the possibility to to take a hot bath outside. <laughs> it's, it's, I think, uh, I'm not sure, of, of course, I've been living in Denmark for now, or, and then in Iceland again, but that's something that is in our DNA to cherish the, the and I think for me at least, oops, is, you know, it, I think it's, it's a very uh, fundamental infrastructure that we claim that we, you know, we have to have, yeah. even though it's, of course, it's nice to have, but, in Iceland, it's need to have. And what about spaces kind of outside the pool? Obviously, the rest of the city that's not water bound. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we are getting there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, you know it it uh, the changes in our municipality plan for 2010, where we actually said city for people. Mm -hmm. it's, it was a huge statement in a way, and we are working on it day by day, trying to emphasize the space in between the houses and not just the houses. And we have loads of bad examples how not to do it, mm -hmm. but uh, we are getting there where we are seeing this is the way to do it. I mean, most cities, kind of the space between the houses is, is roads and cars. So uh, it kind of, uh, I suppose the question is how do you, I mean, maybe Peter, you're working on a, is it car-free city? I mean, you can maybe tell a little bit more, but, um, yeah, well, like, what advantage do you get when you get rid of the cars? <laughs> and, and how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's just such an amount of space that you suddenly uh, get back. Um, and, and if you think of public space uh, in, in uh, let's say, with a car-dominated city, uh, you're planning playgrounds, you're planning parks, but all of a sudden, all this space becomes um, a park. And um, that's just a fantastic uh, game changer. And, um, and, what, and what are you doing with those spaces in, in the Carfree City? What's, what is, I mean, maybe explain what, what is between the houses now? Because I mean, it's like, for me, it's hard to, if I think of a city, you know, there's houses, road, cars. Yeah. What, what, what's. It's space field, for field, nature, parks, it's, it's, sp like it's space for uh, people to also appropriate space to, to yeah. grow their own food uh, and so on. Um, Space or cities are getting denser and denser, mm. and so uh, not everyone has a garden. Um, to to have a bit of that space just in the in the street is mm. is is, uh, is amazing. Um, another, the... let's say, um, thing that's interesting. I was mentioning shortly the soundscape of the city. Uh, if you start recording the sound of the city what you hear everywhere is cars. Basically, that's the only thing you hear. Mm -hmm. So somehow you see all these different areas, but what you hear is cars. Yeah. And this uh, also leads to a very poor 
uh, experience of, of public space. The moment these cars are gone, mm -hmm. it relaxes you completely. So also it does uh, a lot with your mood. I feel like we should have some car noises now to kind of express yes. that. You know, kind of, like, <laughs> turn this kind of calm atmosphere in here into a, <laughs> into a car dominated. I like the phrase car dominated city, kind of rather than city and car free city. Maybe yeah, we yeah. Should, uh, yeah. Use the phrase car we, dominated city and just city. Yeah. Like no, no, traffic planners have been always so incredibly dominant in city planning. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Netherlands, we have the sort of the, the luck that we now need space for climate adaptation. So or more shadow and more, uh, let's say, absorption of water. Mm -hmm. um, so we now have a stick to, to uh, beat with and to actually push uh, the car planners to the, to the second uh, <laughs> position and claim space uh, for green and for, for people. So, so landscape architects are number one and car yes. planners number two. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> and how does that, that relate to Reykjavik? I mean, it's... A, it's Again, I've, I've only been here twice, so, but it seems, again, like many, most cities, car, car dominated. And I imagine the weather. Yeah, it's plays a into totally that as well. car dominated until, I'm not saying until now, because we are still t car dominated. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have still a way of, like, you know, if you're, if you're not talking about the cars, then you're a car hater in a way. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, we have been, uh, it's been too easy. Everything about our infrastructure and the space the car has gotten is, is huge. And when you're talking about noise, I, I just realized uh, some months ago when I'm standing in my grandmother's garden, which just used to be inside the town, Hapnatir, all of a sudden I could hear the traffic around. I couldn't 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it was like, it was loud. It was not just something, but my grandma can't hear anymore, so she's not <laughs> she's not nice to it. But but it's, it struck me because this is you know the the the, the electric cars are still going to make because they are heavier and the, and they are you know making more sounds to the, in the pavement than than the other. So so this is definitely something we should be measuring and and and, and embracing in a way to see what we have to do to. To you know, and how, take how, it down. how does again uh, at the risk of seeing me naive? How does the weather play <laughs> into into that? Because it seems like uh, you know in the UK it rains a lot. We kind of the excuse is like kind of taking my car. I don't want to walk to the bus stop. It's raining. And maybe here you've got an even more exaggerated version of that. The kind of uh, I, uh, I, th I think. It you know, I've been taking the bus now for, for two years from Hapnafir to Reykjavik. And for me, I was like, I haven't met the day where I didn't do this and take my 10, 15 minutes of work. Mm -hmm. The weather has never been that, that bad. And yes, of course, in between, it gets, you know, what do you call it, oranges uh, and red zones where you just don't go out. But mm -hmm. more or less, you know, they, we have this freshness in the weather and, the, and this dry, so it's very easy to take a warm clothes and, and just be in outside. But I think that's also the, just the change of how, you know, before trying to survive, going out to the ocean, trying to get, go come back alive. Now it's more, you know, now we are thinking, we're, we're not doing that anymore, but mm. we're just trying to travel in between. And it's, it's I think it's a myth. I think. Okay. I think <laughs> so just get outside. Just get outside and, and experience it. It's not that bad. Yeah, I mean, that's the yeah, attitude in the UK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no, I mean, it, it's, it's, I think it requires a mentality change. Um, in the Netherlands, everybody's used to biking, be outside, even the prime minister bikes to work, mm. and, and um, uh, so it's very much in our uh, culture. But even there, let's say, going towards a car-free city is, is, a, is a big step. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's also about what is the, because people will always keep on using cars uh, and have either a shared car or an owned car somewhere. Part. And then it's just about increasing the acceptable distance uh, between home and uh, that, uh, that point. So kind of that, um, that final step. The final kind of step. Like and and uh, the more attractive that space is, mm -hmm. the longer people are yeah. willing to uh, walk. Yeah, yeah. So you're willing to walk yeah, to 100 meters down through a park or... 200 meters. Yeah, exactly. 200 meters. Yeah. Is, there, is there a figure? Yes, yes. Thicker, well, so. <laughs> I was just no, no, fucking no, no. from it's the different everywhere. <laughs> it's depending on uh, indeed climate, yeah. culture, etc. But like 100 or 200 meters through a park, but maybe only five along a busy road. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that, that makes makes total sense. The what you just touched on there about the kind of you know 
being outdoors and loving maybe loving the the the, sit, the, the landscape a bit more. Uh, you said with, with Holland, it surprised me. You have a love, love hate relationship with the landscape there. It, it, it's as an outsider, it, that seems strange. <laughs> that that was, it seems odd that there's anything to hate. It's, uh, we're very jealous of people in Iceland. I yeah. mean, we, we miss a bit of that drama. Okay. So it's all flat. It's yeah. all, uh, <laughs> there is no surprise. There yeah. is no... Uh, uh, and yeah. probably, probably here you'd like a bit more regularity. A bit more, like, <laughs> a bit more exchange. Yeah. 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 An exchange, yeah. Maybe we'll ship a bit across. That seems not very sustainable, mm. though. So not, not, not one for the near future. But then the, the, I mean, back to landscapes. And like, how would you envisage, I mean, it feels like some of your projects in the archaeological world wouldn't necessarily work here. Have you, have you worked in environments that are harsher than the Netherlands or Belgium? Or how would you go about creating a space here? That was yeah, work, yeah, that's a very good people, question. I suppose. Exactly, exactly. No, I think this, um, we work quite a lot internationally. And, and of course, we notice big changes. We always start with the same ambition. But then, uh, for instance, in Portugal, um, that also has this very short history of, uh, of let's say, urban life, um, and, and sort of most of the people used to be a farmer one generation ago. Mm -hmm. This whole love for nature is hardly there. You mm -hmm. know? So somehow this thought of um, increasing the quality of public space with uh, with nature is not really really appreciated. In the DNA. Um, but also there, I think it's also um, sort of, there's always global trends that then also end up in, in places like that. And, and let's say set in motion this slow uh, change of perception. I suppose and mentality. I was kind of drilling down to this, how would you create a space in Reykjavik that would draw people in all the way around the world, like all the way year round, that would be a place that people could enjoy? What would be the key kind of elements to a, a space here? No, I, th I think it's very interesting to uh, what you mentioned about the pools, that of course they offer a microclimate. In the end, it's very often about creating the right microclimate. Mm. These are changing through climate change. Mm. Um, we're working on a project in France, in Lyon, where actually former hangars, um, we're now planning them to become sort of climate refuge mm -hmm. spaces. So there is going to be the hottest space of France. Um, they become the sort of the, the shadowed cool spots in summer that the city is lacking. And I can imagine also here, perhaps it's a sort of a hybrid between built and, and open uh, space. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you, because I thought it was so interesting when you showed uh, pieces from the airport where you're working with mm -hmm. animals. Yeah. Is it possible to have horses around airports? <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because we, when no, you, when, that's one of the things that struck me when we land in Keplavik, it's always like you are landing on the moon. Can we have animals there? Can we have mm. sheep and horses? Totally, and totally. No, I think it was, so we, we Sounds like you're getting yourself a contract here to, to, to redesign <laughs> the airport. Like. I just want the horses back in the city, okay. just to make it clear. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the problem with nature on airports is mainly the birds. Because oh, some yeah. birds, when they get into the, the turbines, mm -hmm. they uh, uh, create damage. But horses don't. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> certain, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean if, if a horse did get in there, it probably cause a lot of damage, right? Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel we're going a little bit off track. So, yeah, sorry, you were, you, were, you were saying, sorry, I interrupted to make a joke. No, no, that's <laughs> it. And then in the end, it's about engineering the right type of ecology that yeah. attracts the birds mm -hmm. that don't cause damage when they fly into the engine. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, 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 a strange place to wrap it up, <laughs> a, a, a place to wrap it up, let's say. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, finish with one thing that you said, I think that both of you probably agree on. The, the, the line I liked from your presentation the most uh, was that you're building environments to encourage sustainable lifestyles. Um, it feels like something that kind of everyone can strive for. So I just wanted to say that was a super interesting line. <laughs> that was it. So thanks, uh, thanks Peter, Brug Hilda. Um, we're now, Paul Gilder, sorry. And we're going to pass over to the next speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I told you we'd have big questions today. We're asking questions about horses around airports. Very important stuff. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, next up, we have Sigríður Sunna Reynisdóttir, or Sigga Sunna. 
She is the founder and artistic director of Thikyo Design Collective for Children and their families. Thikyo is the Icelandic noun for make-believe, as the company aims to stimulate the imagination and creativity of children during play. Before Thikyo, Sigrid Sunna worked as a scenography designer and festival director. It is an all-in-all all joyous and sparkly human being. Welcome to the stage, Sigrid Sunna. Happy festival, everyone. Hello. Um, the word Thikyo is one of my absolute favorite words. As Guðrun Sóley mentioned, um, it's the Icelandic word for make-believe, and it's used by children when playing. When playing make-believe, you can put on a cape and become a Thikyo bird flying in the air. When playing make-believe, you can crawl under a dinner table and turn it into a Thikyo submarine. Everything is possible when you're playing Thikyo. For me, this word contains the limitless power of the human imagination. It's the source of creative thinking we start cultivating as children and continue using throughout life. Thikyo is also the name of a design collective I founded four years ago. It's an interdisciplinary design project for children and their families. We started with a costume collection called Superheroes of the Earth. Um, it's an ode to the wild animal kingdom as well as the wilderness of our imagination. It's sustainable fashion design made in materials from local industries that would otherwise go to waste. Today, our, product, our design projects range from costume design to furniture, experiential design, installations and toy design. In our production development, we apply local expertise and technical equipment from diverse local industries. Thikyo is a design collective. We believe in the magic that happens when you gather different hats into the same room and dream together and think of new solutions. We are designers from diverse backgrounds, each bringing a set of tools from our design fields to one mutual toolbox. I am a sonography designer. Ninna is a children's culture designer. Sigurbjörg is a fashion designer. And Erla is an architect. We collaborate across our design fields, and we also inc increasingly work with specialists uh, from a broad range of fields. They include biologists, musicians, uh, craftsmen, and scholars. We collaborate with cultural institutions on meeting children at their eye level, designing spaces, places, and projects on their terms. Children are around 27% of the whole world. That's close to a third. Um, but children cannot be elected into parliaments. They cannot uh, vote on who sits in a parliament. But the parliament here in Iceland and in many other countries has acknowledged the convention of the child. It's a very important legal document. It's a pact we've made as a society to honor children's rights and to empower them. We as designers in Thikyo are trying our best to activate the articles we can and encourage others to do the same. The 12th article and the 13th articles talk about how adults should listen to children and create platforms for their voices to be heard. Krakkar Thikyo translates as Thikyo's Kids Consultant Panel. It's an umbrella for all our collaboration and conversations with children throughout our design process. We design for children with children. It's a way to empower kids as uh, our most important specialists, because kids are experts on being kids. It was crucial to design a logo for Krakkarauth because uh, grown-ups respect logos. They take uh, companies and institutions more seriously to ha so who have logos. Um, and it's just a small way to show how graphic design can be an empowering tool. Um, today, I want to talk about how perception of time altered in the pandemic 
and how we could learn to treat time differently as designers and as a community. The time we get to think, sense and communicate. How we make time and space to let other people into our process and how we can collaborate. I've been thinking about the difference between linear time and deep time. See, linear time is the, time of, it's the kind of time that makes you tired. It's like this. It's vertical and you run in one direction and it wears you out. Whereas deep time, it gives you more space and it helps you to go under the surface. Um, I want to give you three examples of Thikyo projects where we got a taste of deep time and how rewarding it can be. The first project is our furniture collection called Shelters. They're designed for children and their parents to retreat to a shell inspired by snails and seashells. We wanted to explore ways to become an introvert in public, turning our attention to quality of sound, light and tactile sensory experiences. But it all started with an invisible idea, an exercise in using the imagination. What would it be like if people could crawl into a shell when they needed to? In our research period, we were curious. We wanted to know everything about animals who live in shells. Internet was okay, books were good as well, but we wanted to find biologists to go deeper. So I decided to try something I learned growing up in my childhood street. See, if there was a kid you didn't know yet, but you wanted to play with, you would simply go to their door and knock and ask, do you want to come out and play? And it's a great trick because usually they say yes and they come out and play. If they say no, you just go to the next door. Um, and it always worked. There was always a lot of kids to play with. Um, so I did exactly that. We did exactly that. We knocked on biologists' doors to see if they wanted to play. There was a wonderful group of scientists at the Naturally Hi Natural History Museum of Kobur who said yes. Not only did they want to come out and play, they invited us in. They invited us to access their extensive shell collection and pointed us forward in their research. I remember Seurbjörg, one of our designers, describing the sessions with them as going on a long walk on all the seashores of the whole planet. And it's a beautiful way to describe what we all felt. It was deep time. In the middle of the pandemic, another door opened. It was a neighbor living opposite to the biologists. They were also up for playing with us. We were invited into Gerdarsab Art Museum as artists in residency. We set up shop amongst sculptures of Gerdur, who was a pioneer in abstract sculptures. In her day, Gerdur would exhibit miniature scale models of her sculptures as pieces of art in their own right. And we got inspired to do the same and honor the stage of model making, taking time. Our work process was open to the public for several months. Through pop-up installations, guided tours, workshops for hundreds of school children and kindergartens. See, because during this time, during COVID restrictions, the only groups allowed into the museums were kindergarten groups and school classes from, from primary schools. And we took the opportunity with the museum. What happened was that kids got to experience time with us. They got insight into how a designer goes from an idea, an invisible thing of the imagination, to a miniature scale model, and they waited excitedly with us as the pieces were being built in the workshop until they arrived full size to the museum to be enjoyed. If we want to raise a generation that appreciates design and craftsmanship, we have to let them in. It's important to witness the time and care things are made with in order to respect them. It's important to give context and see how an idea, a fruit of the imagination, can materialize into objects. The second, ob uh, second project I want to tell you about is called Let Us Nest. It's a furniture project inspired by the nests of passerine birds. As a part of our mission to design sust sustainably, we looked for local craftsmen who were experts in basket weaving. 
who could weave nests big enough for kids? The quest led us to Blindravinnustova, the Icelandic organization for the visually impaired. Denni, who is pictured here, has woven for their workshop over the past 30 years. He was the expert we wanted to work with. Denni is legally blind, so the collaboration between our designers and Denni involved finding new ways of communicating ideas and design beyond technical drawings and visual stimuli. So our meeting point was actual bird nests borrowed from the biologists. Instead of saying, see in this drawing here, we could say, can you feel this curve here on the nest? We really like this shape, can we blow it up in scale? The deep time here was the time experienced in Dennis workshop, when a designer and craftsman are face to face, going out of their comfort zones and finding a meeting point to share their expertise. In this project, we consulted children on sizes of nests and material choices, but next time we said, let's bring them in even earlier. Which brings me to the last project I want to tell you about. It's a project in this very house, on the first floor of the building. It's called Hljóðhimnar, and is the home of children's culture here in Harpa. Hljóðhimnar is a manifestation of the importance of making space and time for children in our cultural institu institutions and public places. It's a space designed on their terms to give equal access to culture and to arts. Hljóðhimnar is placed in the heart of Harpa Music and Conference Hall. Hljóðhimnar is a permanent installation for children and families, an invitation to experience the vast world of music and sound. The design of the space is inspired by the magical journey of a sound wave passing through different parts of our ear. We start in the outer ear, where children can conduct the Iceland Symphony Orchestra. The ear canal is the first pit stop of the sound wave. Here we tune into the music of the animal kingdom through a collection of instruments called animelodies. We continue on our journey of the sound wave to the middle ear, where we can snuggle up to lullabies sung by the Icelandic opera. The inner ear is the final destination of the sound wave, entering through the oval window. There we can retreat into the cochlea for a moment of silence. Reykjavik Big Band introduces us to rhythm patterns. The operator allows for phone calls abroad to explore singing in different languages. I have often walked down the street before. The stereo wheel of the Reykjavik Big Band allows us to sail the oceans of music, traveling from Latin swing to New Orleans jazz. We welcome you to come aboard and visit Hljóðhimnar at Harpa. So as I said, we wanted to start the project with conversation and collaboration with kids earlier than we had ever done before. We started the research and brainstorming process with over 100 children the age of 5 to 7. They were invited here to Harpa to take part in workshops and voice their opinions. They got to see the empty space, full of possibilities, and influence how it would turn out. This co collaboration and conversation was the foundation on which all design work for Hljóðhimnar was subsequently based. One of the many results from our collaboration with kids was their wish for textures and textiles. They wanted to have everything soft and cozy. 
They created their own miniature scale models, often placing carpets on walls, which we thought was a fantastic idea. They also wished for nooks and crannies, secret places to retreat to. One of the manifestos of the project was to ac work across disciplines with artists, scientists and designers collaborating. It means that behind this collection of instruments are amongst others, musician Soleil and biologist Etta, as well as a team of builders and engineers. It means that behind this piece are carpenters, engineers, interactive designers and a whole symphony orchestra. To make it visible, we documented the process carefully and mediated online in collaboration with the Children's News on the National Broadcasting Service. We wanted kids to know that adults took this seriously, that they were working together. We also curated an event program which enforced the 31st article of the Convention of the Child that all children should have equal access to culture and the arts for free. When we talk about kids, we sometimes talk about them like they're a different species, or aliens even. Oh, they like to touch things. Oh, they need to go out and play. Ah, okay, then they really need to be heard and seen. Well, they are human. They're just worse at hiding it than adults, luckily. Um, they make it clear when they're not being met as holistic, multi-sensory human beings. What we've learned as designers working extensively with kids as our experts is to practice what we preach. Play is the highest form of research, said Albert Einstein. We agree. We need to touch things as designers, not only see them with their eyes. I wrote large parts of this lecture walking in a valley and swimming in the pool. It was more effective for my brain than sitting the whole time in my studio in front of the computer. It didn't take longer time, it just took deep time. Because human beings are not designed to sit in 90 degrees all day. Right now, you can only see me on this stage, but it's very far from being a one-woman show. That's why I want to invite my fellow designers, Nina, Sippa and Erla, to the stage, because I want you to see them. They didn't want to speak, but I want you to see them. Um, <laughs> So you can see us, you can see that we are more than one person. Um, and right now, the final thing, I know the clock is ticking, but I want to do a final thing. Um, it's an exercise for the imagination for all of you, both you who are here and also the invisible people who are watching in stream. Okay, um, I want you to imagine the following people standing on this stage with us. Um, it's a photographer, Sigala, our graphic designer, Ivar, five biologists, seven carpenters, two weavers, three tailors, five art historians, three engineers, 800 children, a symphony orchestra, a choir of the Icelandic opera, and I could go on. Because it takes a village to raise a child, and we need to do just that, as designers and as a community. And we need to do it in deep time. Thank you. Just imagine for a second, what if you can suck out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and replace it with fresh oxygen by simply wearing clothes? Hi everyone, I'm DJ. And I'm Hans. We are co-founders of Post Carbon Lab. Fashion is responsible for 10% humanity's carbon emissions, which is more than international flights and maritime shipping combined. In addition, the industrial dyeing process contributes to 20% of global water pollution, releasing carcinogens and heavy metals into local water ecosystems. Synthetic dyes are not only toxic with known health hazards, but are also non-biodegradable and can hinder 
the natural decomposition of plant or protein-based fibers, leading to further soil, water and air contamination. To support the textile supply chains with better manufacturing processes, we offer sustainable and regenerative R&D services like microbial dyeing, pigmentation, screen printing, bioprinting, coating and washes. By working with microorganisms that are naturally abundant around us, we can create colors, compounds and agents that are applicable in textile processing. Our photosynthetic coating is a living layer of photosynthetic microorganisms that we embed into textiles. What this means is that it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releases oxygen during both our production and the user phase. Essentially, we are providing a climate positive output for everyone that's wearing clothes. To function as a business, we will have carbon footprints that we have to justify through our company operations and activities. To maximize our impacts as a regenerative business, we employ a radical waste first sourcing policy. This means we upcycle urban waste like fridges, construction windows and household appliances into bio-laboratory equipment and office furniture. Buying first hand is our last resort. And we're proud to say that 89% of our business is built on waste and upcycling without using any new resources from our precious planet. Thank the Post Carbon Lab for that video. It is founded by Dian Jen Lin and Hannes Hulstert, and it's a collaboration oriented social enterprise offering circular and regenerative microbial finishing research and development service to textile based businesses. As you can see in that beautiful video, more of an artwork, really, like so many things we've seen today. Uh, I also want to thank Sirius Sunna and Thikyo for their contribution. Uh, I really, really want to get like an adult-sized shell to crawl into uh, or a nest to curl into on, on bad days or cold ones. But next up is Sigurður Thorsteinsson. He's a designer, partner at Design Group Italia and brand strategy director at the Blue Lagoon here in Iceland. He has been in uh, Design Groups Italia's chief design director for more than 20 years, with projects spanning from healthcare sector to food, engineering products to skincare and travel destinations. Sigurður started working with the Blue Lagoon in 1997 and in 2016 became Blue Lagoon's chief brand and design officer and has since been responsible for all brand and design activity of the Blue Lagoon. Welcome to the stage, Sigurður. Hi all, so what now? Uh, it's a bit difficult question and uh, as we have seen today there's a lot of technology, a lot of future going on so but I'm going to go a little bit back because I, I guess I am what Peter said before, our ancestor. Not because I studied in Milan in the 80s, but mainly because I'm kind of analytical and I tend to go backwards on things and try to understand it from the past. So I, I went to study in Milan in the 80s, uh, Memphis was the key, and, and um, so it was very much about, uh, I'm industrial designer, so it's very much about stuff and making things. So I come from that culture, I lived there now in 36 years, I kind of spend my time back and forth. And uh, I con on this journey, I've kind of gone through a lot of different phases. And um, I kind of, when this uh, clean asked me about talking here, I kind of wanted to go a little bit back to a little bit of uh, things I've learned through this passage and then kind of try to tell you 
what some little stories and uh, based on that, uh, then a bigger story about uh, how Blue Lagoon evolved. So uh, Shakespeare famously said that there is a lot in the word. I mean, we kind of tend to take some things for granted and we take words for granted and uh, we sustainability and we kind of think about sustainability today. It's very much about the environment and so on. But if you go back in the 70s, sustainability was about economics. It actually was not about sustainability. And that's actually the, probably one of the reasons why we have the mess we have today, because it was just about one aspect of it. And, uh, you know, foreigners often ask me, I've got a lot of friends coming over here, and they always ask me, why on earth did you place this at the first thing when you come to Reykjavik? It's an aluminum smelter. I don't know, it's a, probably planning have changed since then. But, uh, well, it's actually happened if you're not Reykjavik, sorry. Uh, but the objective was that it was actually the, the smelter that financed one of the first big dam that created uh, electricity and was kind of foundation. So it was very important for Icelanders actually and it was hailed as a big achievement. Today we would actually probably not hail it as a big achievement. And this brings me to one learning is that context. Uh, we have talked about people mention of context but I think it's undervalued because context is fluid and is evolving. I mean, I've just put there, you know, technology, nature, human, and, and, and economics. I mean, somehow we could say these are the big issues that we somehow type have to combine together and find. But what I just want to point out is that a vision at given time is not constant. So what was sustainable in the 70s is not necessarily sustainable in today. 20, 30 years later. So there is kind of an evolution on this. And another point is also that the solution that may fit for New York is not gonna, about transportation, is not gonna fit for Delhi or Reykjavik. So we always have to be aware that context is very fluidable and it's different in time and space. Another thing which, you know, was a bit scary when I read this in the 220, is a tipping point. And this is a moment where human-made stuff is heavier than the biomass. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. And uh, for me, it's, you know, good and bad in this, and because somehow the human activity is making things. And, uh, but everything that is made is, has to be planned. In a way, you can say it has to be designed, because if you made it, it there was some kind of a planning that said, we're gonna do first this and this and that. You have some things that were made 2,000 years ago, they're still valid, they're still standing, so we cannot say everything is bad that has been designed and played and all the stuff we made. But then again, a lot of it has been bad. There's a lot of overflux. And, you know, designers have been criticized and sometimes they said, oh, it's the fault of the designers, you know. We designed too many stuff, too, too many things, and then it's made. And I'm pretty sure that what we are doing today, 20, 30 years down the road, people will look back, like we are looking at back at things happening in the 60s and 70s and say, what on earth were they thinking? Why were they doing these things? And this brings me to another point. It's not the designer's fault. The problem is that the designers are not in the right room. In Italy, there's a very nice expression. It basically says that if you want to be in command and control, you have to be in the Stanza del Bottone. It's very simple. Stanza del Bottone means the room where all the buttons are. And you have to get in there because that's where things happen. That's where you push the button. Doesn't matter if politics, or whatever. You have to be in the room with the buttons. And that's, I think, because designers, I mean, we, when I use the word designer, I mean architects, design, I mean the whole crowd. I'm, I'm not making any distinction. And I think it's so fundamental that they are actually in the room of control, in the authority. They have something to say and they are actually involved with deciding what is going to be done and not just make it nice afterwards or whatever. But we also then need a wider knowledge. We have to know more because a lot of designers are artisans. We like making things, we like the beautiful things. And this sometimes hinders us because, you know, Michael, today IDEO is a famous, you know, the feasibility, desirability, viability, you have millions of these kinds of different variations. And if you want to be in the room where the decisions are made, you have to know about the economics. You have to know about how business works. You have to know about, technology at least, so you can kind of sustain whatever you're kind of thinking about and doing. And you have to understand the people. That's actually what the designs probably does best, that's understanding people. And now, 
fortunately, because amazingly so, if you go on Google and you Google uh, this kind of a feasibility, there's a billions with the three bubbles. There's only one which actually has the four. So nature has come in play. It's very funny. It's just recently that in design thinking, <laughs> nature become an, you know, an issue. But thanks, God. But with all this, there comes another problem. And this is what we are probably underestimating, that the complexity is the new normal. And the complexity is something that is dynamic. And it's very difficult to solve complex problems. Because as soon as you solve them, they have changed. And so whatever you solved is not relevant anymore, and you have to go back. So we have to find some new ways of dealing with it. You probably have to frame it, reframe it, and whatever. Uh, this is another ancestor. This kind of is actually ancestor. I mean, he's getting pretty old. But Don Norman has made a very influential books and is kind of the father of UX, UI, all that. And he has a very simple, it's a nice video by him. It's basically saying design education is flawed. Designers need to be an authority, but then we have to step up to it. And he mentioned, I was very happy to hear today from Thicke, or they were saying, talking about transdisciplinary approach, because it's so obvious it's design should be, because if you need a lot of knowledge, you need to understand, you need to know how to work together different disciplines, to how leverage that. So this is something that kind of small story. Uh, there's another little story. Some of you knew this. <laughs> 2008, there was a little event in Iceland. Not only in Iceland, but Iceland got rather badly out of it. Uh, and after that, there was a lot of question, you know, should we make more dams? You just dam the bloody country and you have a lot, we solved the problem. Should we do something more? And out of this, there came all kinds of activity. Of those of you, I mean, it was a great, I was living in Iceland that period. And it was a great moment because of all the energy, creativity, doing something new. I was happy enough to be with a group of people, transdisciplinary group of designers, architects, philosophers, that created a group called Friends of Water. And it was just a think tank kind of saying, let's have a vision about, you know, Iceland, there's so much water, hot water, cold water. The map is just a water. Uh, how can we use water in a different way than actually just creating electricity out of it? This led to a nice work we did with Björk around the spark. A lot of people were involved with this. And it kind of was saying, let's think everything up again. Some years later, not very much left of this. And there was another learning in this for me, is that somehow there was, it was a very sustainable idea. It was a beautiful project. They, everyone loved them, but they didn't have economic sustainability. There was no economics behind it. And uh, it doesn't matter how enthusiastic you feel about it, in two, three, four years, that spirit goes away and things flatten down. So you have to have something of that. Uh, then there is a final little story, and uh, some of you may know it, but I think it's incredible that this is not so much used. It's um, design-driven innovation. is something that designers talk about, but the uh, engineer, exactly Verganti, wrote about it because engineers are much better of taking knowledge and write it, what designers are doing, than designers themselves. I don't understand why. Uh, it's the concept of meaning. It's the concept of innovation. In Iceland, I think a lot of the infrastructure, government, they don't understand that design has any role in innovation, which is amazing for me, because uh, design is actually one driver of an innovation, because it's the greatest tool we have to change meaning. And uh, it's not always very clear what is meant by meaning. And I kind of put up this slide just to help you. I mean, OK, the lemon squeezer, some of you may know who are older, was a tool. Then Philip Stark designed a very nice one. And OK, a lot of people have criticized it because it doesn't function, and Don Norman hated it, and all that. But it was a very clever move, because Philip Stark understood much earlier than anyone else that nobody was going to be cooking in 20 years. Everyone would buy things. So you didn't need anymore a lemon squeezer as a tool. You needed a lemon squeezer to say, I have taste. I have a gourmet. I know what is good. So the lemon squeezer became a symbol for something else. And the same with bicycles. Bicycles used, they are still used by some people as a tool for moving from A to B. Then you had the mountain bikes. Hmm. Then it became fun and a leisure and something exciting to do. And now lately it has become the racer. I live, have an apartment by the harbor, and you always see a lot of people, 14, 15, running together in this kind of 
very narrow suits and bicycling on the races. It has nothing to do with going from A to B. It's okay, you can say it's a fitness, health. No, it's a show off, it's a status. <laughs> I am cool because I go on a bicycle and I'm a racer and I, you understand? So the meaning of a bicycle has changed. The meaning of a lemon squeezer has changed. This is an incredibly powerful tool that design has and we haven't been leveraging. So if I take together some of these learning, it's very simple, it's understand the context, undervalued all the time. Well, have a vision, it helps, it kind of helps guiding you where you want to go and things like that. Be courageous, daring, I mean you really need courageous, you need to be that to, to do something different and, and, and go ahead. Design thinking or design in the room of the buttons. That's fundamental if you want to impact and influence something. But then we have to adapt to a new thinking of transdisciplinary approach. We have to be better at that. We have to have a better and bigger understanding and understand the power of meaning. So this is kind of what I was trying to say, what now, okay, what now? So another story, and I'm gonna go fast over this because the time runs out quite quickly. Um, Okay, I've been involved with Blue Lagoon since 97, with a lot of people, a lot of architects, engineers, builders, uh, scientists, and it, it's, a, it's been a fantastic story. Originally, Blue Lagoon is basically a surplus water. It's a waste that comes out from an energy plant. To, it's an ecological disaster, and really. It would never be allowed today. Also, bicycles would never be allowed today because you can fall and hurt yourself. So, a lot of things, would not be allowed today anyway. So energy plant, okay, beautiful, quirky, people started bathing and uh, you know, it started to develop, there was some healing power. I'm not gonna go into the stories too long for that. And you know, we, they were designed some new packaging, they came with new products, but remember the first skincare product of Blue Lagoon came in 95, it's some years ago, the first stores. And there was this huge moment in 99, in Sigurd of from Basel designed with her team, the building, the new spa, but it was a game changer. It was an important, very important building. Uh, it basically changed, it, it put Iceland on a map as being a destination for spa or hot water or bathing or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it was a crucial moment and it started to, to move. Then I'm jumping some 10 years because also the crust did hit all Iceland, but it hit Blue Lagoon very badly. Because in that, from 99 onwards, Blue Lagoon was just running business, was growing and expanding, and then everything collapsed in the bank crisis. It, we had just expanded, the depth went up through the roof, and the company almost collapsed. Not all I, I should maybe know that, but it was very close to, to getting bankrupt that would have ended up in the hands of a German bank. Well, this would not have been so nice. Uh, then you had the eruption. Eruptions in Iceland can be very good things. We have what we call the tourist eruptions. <laughs> they are perfect. They generate a lot of interest, free PR, one of the best marketing we can have. Uh, so we got one, saved everything. And uh, we kind of decided at that time where to go with Blue Lagoon because we could have just decided to go full speed, make a very big hotel we decided to start moving it in a different direction. We re-changed the logo, we re-changed the look and feel. We got, you know, we basically became an icon. And, uh, you know, it's always nice when someone else says you are cool, it kind of helps. But there was also something negative in this because, you know, Iceland, as we, we say, the tourism after the, the volcano in AF, it, it grew so fast, it went out of hand. Blue Lagoon were too crowded. We were basically losing, we were actually creating limits. We are not gonna allow more than these people because we just had to protect and decide what is the maximum capacity we want to have. We could have had Blue Lagoon open 24 hours to 24. I mean, it would always have been full. So we started rethinking and we decided to go upscale. And so with the Blue Lagoon today, we create, introduced the retreat and we decided to move the brand, design the whole experience, more exclusive, more selective. We changed the product. We changed the store downtown, we created the retreat, which is an upscale spa, so we kind of were diversifying, and we wanted to create, a, let's say, a new group of tourism coming to Iceland, which would be more affluent, would be less people, but more affluent, because Iceland's nature is also quite delicate. So 
a lot of nice design jobs. This was actually very typical design jobs, you know, selecting nice furniture and covers and stuff. Fun, fun. Uh, so fun, working with the chefs, great experience. So, great story. Rolagon went from a, you know, being an icon, very successful place, and we kind of went up. I don't think there are very, I think Retreat had got over 32 awards designed, you know, in, in the three and a half year. But what is also very interesting in this is that in through the story, basically Blue Lagoon created a new category. Because today the most popular leisure activity by foreigners in Iceland, number one is visiting nature paths, number two is spa treatments. And then we have a whole lot of hot lagoons around Iceland, which have kind of followed. Which is, you know, great because now you can travel on Iceland, bet Iceland between natural pools and not. So, from ways to well-being, this has been an incredible journey. And in this journey, we have kind of defined uh, some key aspects, and uh, which is, you know, we strive for a people well-being, a social well-being, environmental well-being, but also economical well-being. So we are trying to do a balance between this. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about another thing we are doing now is, uh, you know, Iceland has the biggest wilderness in Europe, which is left. Uh, it's fantastic. I love it. I go. Have always gone very much up there, and, and I, I love that place. And we are now uh, this summer. Blue Lagoon is going to open. We have worked on the Kettlefjord Mountains, a beautiful area in the center of Iceland. Uh, quite difficult to to go there, and uh, there were some plans of. Uh, there were already some older structures. Some of them were gone, and there were some plans of uh, some years ago to build a very big hotel there. Uh, that this was actually proved, and this was actually they started building it. Uh, we got involved because this would have uh, been quite impactful and the concept uh, came up, the team of uh, working on this was of building a village, basically using what we could of the older buildings, renovating some, rebuilding others, but it's the logic of a village, not of a one big structure. And uh, we have accommodations ranging from camping, camper, sleeping bags, hotel luxury. So it's in the center of Iceland. We want to it's, it's not like there are many, many people that can stay there, but we want to open this access. Uh, it will have a bathing facility opening now 1st of July, uh, but it's mainly about the leisure and the activity you can do there. And uh, we are going to run it the whole winter. This is completely new, and, and you can say from an economic point, probably a bit stupid, but, uh, but it's such a great place. And uh, having that operating the whole winter, keeping the road up there open, that's going to be a challenge, but it's also going to open access. A lot, a lot of photographers are very enthusiastic about that because now the road is going to be accessible <laughs> also during the winter. The rooms are pretty neat. And like I said, we just before, the weather can be bad in Iceland. Normally it takes one and a half, two hours to go there. Uh, in February we were going up there and uh, it took 12 hours. <laughs> and the cars were not small, <laughs> but the weather was really bad. <laughs> Uh, but amazingly, when we came up there after 12 hours of you know going through the snow and everything, the sky cleared up, and this was the place. So the journey was difficult, and it's the journey that we have all gone through. Design is a difficult journey, but I think when we manage to do projects and we like the arrival point, it's such a fantastic thing. And I know I talked a little bit longer than planned, but I just want to close on one note. Because what I've learned, another thing, just the last, a lot of these pro projects, they are very complex. You are trying to balance many different things. And I believe to, to be able to do that, uh, designers have to be, Michael tomorrow, this morning was talking about music and, and design. I often refer to music. I often see myself as a conductor. You have a group of band playing and there's a conductor, you always say, what is he doing? He's just doing something, no? And I seem like I'm not doing so much often, but I'm somehow aligning things up, trying to put, because this process of design, this goes back, it goes forward, it goes here and there. It's trying to balance between technology, nature, human element, economy and everything. And it's struggle for me. And you sometimes have to choreograph a path through that, through that vision. And uh, my role through this year has mainly been that of a uh, design conductor. It's trying to conduct and not lose that. It's so difficult and, and, and easy to lose it. So with this, I just uh, yeah, want to thank you all. And uh, I hope you have learned something from it today. Thanks.
Thank you, Sigurður. And I thought I knew everything about Blauerlónið, but I didn't. Uh, next up is Lee Baker from Graphic Rewilding. I personally have been thinking about my happiness a little bit <clears throat> the past few weeks, months, years, and particularly how I can hack it. And Lee is going to tell me, and he's going to share it with you as well. I'm excited. He's an artist and a composer and works on the project Graphic Rewilding which places vast nature-inspired artworks at the center of often overlooked urban spaces. They connect digital creativity and ancient traditional art and encourage people to connect with nature and each other. I dare you to name or find a better goal of some sort. Welcome on stage, Lee. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I feel like I'm in competition with Sakir for the uh, <laughs> beard action going on there. Um, so, <laughs> so um, before I start this talk, um, I'd like you to take a look at a video. Um, many of you will probably recognize this film. Uh, some of you have probably stared at it endlessly. I'm not about to launch a new mobile phone. Um, but before I start the talk, I'd like you to look at this film for a while and just concentrate on it for a little bit. I did, I did think this might come across as some weird hypnotism thing, but I'm not going to get everyone sleepwalking around the room. But if you could just calm your brains for a bit and just have a look. Before this gets too awkward, I'm going to, uh, going to chat over this. So you watch that. I'm going to chat. And uh, I want you to notice how it makes you feel. If it sparks anything, any imagination. If, it, if you notice your breathing, maybe, for a minute. And uh, see what comes up in your imagination, because I'm going to come back to this a bit later. OK, so. As I was introduced very nicely, uh, my name's Lee Baker. I wear lots of hats. It's very, very difficult to put me in a, a box. It's also very difficult to introduce me because I do a lot of different things. And I'm always a bit reticent to talk about all of them because it kind of, sometimes I worry that it detracts from the others. But um, I'm the creative director of Produce UK, an international placemaking agency and event making agency. That's one hat that I wear. I'm a music composer and producer for television. I write for things like the Grammys. I've written for Formula One launches, all kinds of stuff for about 25 years. And then what I do is I take all that money and I throw it into a ridiculous project that I do over here called Skip Gallery. Um, and we fund and support and advocate for artists. And we make space where space doesn't exist, basically, for artists, because we feel, especially in the UK, there's a severe lack of opportunities for artists out there. On top of that, I'm a visual artist. And this comes back to what we're talking about today, really, because I paint flowers. It's a very simple thing. I paint flowers. A lot of the ideas I've been listening to today are amazing. They're big ideas, huge ideas. My thing is that I paint flowers and... <laughs> yeah, it's that small. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, when it comes to, uh, well, a lot of things actually, but, but researching the intersection between art and nature, and I'm rather passionate about the positive effect that this combination has on all our minds. So over the next 20 minutes, I'd love to chat to you about these subjects related to art and nature and the effect it has on us and how all of this fits in with what I get up to in one of my day jobs which I like to uh, melodramatically describe as hacking people's happiness through simple, vast, graphic, colourful images of flowers in public spaces uh, with a project called Graphic Rewilding, as they said. So I thought a talk title like, uh, hack your happiness in 20 minutes, you know, would get bums on seats, but I see the bums are already on the seats, so it's uh, pointless. But it's not just a snappy little title. In 2019, Studies appearing in Frontiers in Psychology showed that a 20-minute walk 
in nature is enough to significantly improve your mood and reduce feelings of stress and anxiety. So there you have it, my work here is done. Uh, <laughs> you're better off nicking off to the fabulous Icelandic uh, landscape and uh, rather than sitting here listening to me uh, chat on. But a walk in nature improves your mood. So far, so obvious. But as nature becomes less and less available in many urban environments, it's also been shown that exposure to some pictures of nature also has a, an effect on the mind. Patients who have images of nature in hospital waiting rooms have lower levels of stress and anxiety. Viewing nature images increases activity in brain regions associated with attention and emotion regulation, as well as increased alpha wave activity associated with relaxation and meditative states. We've all been told this stuff before, um, but it's simply not the facts that I want to show you. I want to spark your curiosity and imagination about how we enjoy nature and flowers and why they make us happy. You see, I used to think it was all a bit obvious too. Nature makes you happy. Hello, it's nature. But when I started investigating how and why our graphic rewilding flowers make me happy and other people feel great, I quickly realised it was far more nuanced and involved than I thought. And I was on the precipice of an epic, exciting, slightly out of my intellectual depth research rabbit hole. The truth is, even a super simple image of a painted flower can not only have a huge impact on your emotions and happiness levels, it can also raise far more profound existential questions about your perception of the world than I'd actually thought possible. When you look at a painted flower, you're not just seeing the colours and shapes that objectively tell you that this is a painted flower. You're also, no matter how subtly, interpreting what it represents. You may see the flower as a symbol of beauty, growth, innocence, love, desire, or even the ephemeral nature of being, depending on the lens of your own biases and beliefs, which often come from cultural conditioning. Cultural conditioning. For instance, take a look at this Alpine, Alpine mountain scape video. I saw very similar ones on the plane over here, all of Iceland. You're really, really used to this stuff. It's the kind of stuff you see in publicity for here and also on relaxation YouTube channels, often with seriously cheesy piano. <laughs> How does this make you feel? Does it make you feel peaceful, tranquil, uplifted, expansive? Nowadays, we all accept this as a serene, relaxing scene and are told by all forms of media and Gwyneth Paltrow that Mother Nature <laughs> is a benevolent source of beauty, serenity, and well-being. But before the 18th century in the West, if you'd said that a walk in nature was good for you, you'd have been laughed at or guided to the nearest sanitarium. Back then, nature was often frightening to be endured and survived. The Bible said that mountains were the detritus of creation, and when forced to travel across the Alps, a Welsh priest called the Adam of Usk asked to be blindfolded so as not to witness these horrendous aberrations. And others described the Alps as nature's boils, blisters, and warts, and even called the peaks the devil's arse and nature's genitals. <laughs> it wasn't until the English philosopher Edmund Burke came along in the mid-1700s and wrote that the sublime, i.e. the contemplation of something vast and potentially threatening, like mountains, was actually a good thing that people started to change their minds. The point is, even though our brain has, as neuroscientist Anjean Chatterjee put it, been sculpted by nature and tightly coupled to the environment, our minds can still be easily swayed by culture, education, and life circumstance. And even though we all rightly assume that exposure to nature is good for us and makes us happy, the forces of evolution that have kept us tightly coupled to nature for millennia have become more and more strained through factors such as urbanization. Before the juggernaut of urbanization came along to remodel the planet beyond recognition, one evolutionary theory that explains why we find nature and flowers so uplifting is that for approximately six to seven million years, our hunter-gatherer ancestors analyzed the landscape for fitness indicators because they wanted to be well-fed and avoid being the food. The safe places to settle tended to have water sources, 
open spaces, distant horizon views, trees to shelter from the sun and escape from those pesky saber-toothed tigers. Although this tree doesn't look like it's saving anyone from anything anytime soon. Essentially, uh, nature's uh, original feng shui. There were also flowers acting like bright beacons, being sexy for insects, but also signaling for humans that an area was healthy and would have good foraging in the near future. According to another theory, these landscapes reflect the East African savannas where humans evolved, and studies have been shown that even babies respond positively with dilating pupils to images of these kinds of environments. Urban explosion. Jump forward a few million years, and the start of the Industrial Revolution led to the rapid growth of urbanization and significantly changed our living environments. In 1700, only 3% of the world's population lived in urban areas, and now that is 60%, something that's reflected in uh, the population of Reykjavik and Iceland. But globally, this will increase to 85% in 2100, from 18 million city dwellers in the 1700s to 9 billion by 2100. That's a hell of a leap in a few hundred years. And in Europe, more than 60% of city dwellers live in areas with insufficient green space, and of those, by far the largest proportion are, unsurprisingly, from lower incomes and ethnic minorities. Here in Reykjavik, that number is 65%. And in London, no surprise, 75%. Why am I telling you this? Well, as an artistic counterbalance to the severe lack of green space in cities, I co-founded Graphic Rewilding with artist and producer Catherine Borofsky, who's somewhere in the audience, but too shy to get on stage, in order to create vast, flower-inspired, maximalist, attention-grabbing, positively-inducing artworks and immersive environments in often overlooked urban spaces. Catherine's own passion for public art is born from her upbringing in an inner city council estate in London, and so this is a subject that's close to her heart. Our vibrant images of nature are set in opposition to the grey concrete jungle, and though these obviously could never provide the same environmental and psychological benefits as real nature, we want to inspire people to connect and empathise a little more with the natural world, hopefully mitigating some of the negative effects of a lack of exposure to green space. As an example, early on with Graphic Rewilding, we created a project inspired by Victorian pleasure gardens in some unused asphalted land on a busy road in London. This was a blend of art and planting, and as soon as we opened it to the public, people flooded in and used the space to play, to eat their lunch, and to relax. People said that there was hardly any green space in the area, and even our theatrical garden was a hugely welcome addition to their community. But this isn't isolated. We see this reaction time and time again. So we know there's a need for graphic rewilding, and we know it works. But if it obviously works, why not leave it there? Why bother trying to understand the mental mechanics behind people's happiness and connection with nature through public art? The thing is, Catherine and I were among those kids who grew up playing on concrete rather than grass. Subsequently, like so many kids in cities, I had for many years a total ambivalence to real nature, and I was more at home customising cars and rummaging for car parts in scrapyards than playing poo sticks in the local, slightly toxic river. I always said that Watford, the town near London where I grew up, was a brilliant place to leave. <laughs> Something I read about once really rang a bell with me, and it was a phenomenon known as the extinction of experience where people, be it through lack of proximity or digital distractions, simply forget what nature actually is and so lose empathy for the natural world. I thought, that was me. My mum summed it up perfectly when she said, we love a walk in the countryside as long as it's lined with shops. <laughs> but here's the thing. My awakening to happiness through nature and a more biophilic sensibility came over the years, weirdly through my passion for nature in art. I grew up, my mum was Iranian, she had a lot of very brightly painted um, Iranian paintings in the house of flowers, but there was also a Jura, I don't know if you know it, there's a Jura picture, it might pop up here, of a tuft of earth, very detailed drawing. I was fascinated with this drawing as a kid. Paintings, prints, graphic design, tattoos, textile design, TV, social media, but also, believe it or not, 
through video games. I can't tell you how relaxing I find it, often wandering, often on horseback, through epic landscapes of games like Horizon Zero Dawn or Ghost of Tsushima, often with a sword on my back. Imagine during a high-speed supercar race in the game Gran Turismo, pulling over on the lay-by just to take a look at the stormy sunset on the horizon. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? But tests have proved that people who are exposed to nature in VR and video games experience lower levels of stress or higher levels of positivity compared to those who are exposed to virtual urban environments. I'm certainly not proposing this as a replacement for nature. That's crazy. But I just want to illustrate that our brains can be hacked to suspend disbelief and accept, though we are not interacting with real trees, rocks, and animals, we are psychologically benefiting from a totally imagined nature scenario, something the artist David Hockney likes to describe as new nature. The art I make that feeds into graphic rewilding is an expression of this surrogate connection to nature and in an attempt to understand my own paradoxical fascination with nature in unnatural environments. David Hockney said, the moment you cheat for the sake of art, beauty, you are no, you know you're an artist. With my art, whether I'm painting, using vector graphics, or building a 3D animation, I'm making thousands upon thousands of decisions about color and composition, constantly experimenting until it feels right. If an artwork isn't balanced, then my mind feels uncomfortable, and I find it hard to sleep even. Renowned neuroscientist Samir Zeki argues that by going through this protest process, artists are acting as unwitting neurologists, studying the brain and its organization. They work and rework their art until it pleases their brains. And if it pleases others as well, then they have understood something general about the neural organization, and they have defined the function of art in a way that a modern neurobiologist would feel very sympathetic to. Painting, Constable wrote, is a science and should be pursued as an inquiry into the laws of nature. Zeki prefers to interpret it to mean the laws of the brain. Since the artist, and the viewer after all, can only deal with those attributes of nature which his brain is equipped to see. Zeki went on to declare, beauty is not in the eye, but the brain of the beholder. And to illustrate this point, I want you to take a look at this painting of a flower for a little while. Notice what's going on through your mind. What feelings does it conjure? Does it trigger any emotions? Any memories, any judgments? Now what if I told you that when I painted this, my dad was dying. Does that information shift your perception of this artwork or even reinforce your original thoughts. <laughs> Death is not exactly the uh, best subject for a talk called Hack Your Happiness, uh, but hopefully I <laughs> I've illustrated that the thought component has a huge role to play when observing art and nature. Beauty is not in the eye, but the brain of the beholder. This statement captures the essence of a relatively new field of study known as neuroaesthetics. Neuroaesthetics combines neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, and the arts to understand how the brain processes and responds to aesthetic experiences, including visual art and natural scenery, and how this in turn affects your behavior. I want to try another trick. It's a very unscientific test, which quite frankly could fall, fall embarrassingly on its face. Uh, to show you one of the relevant ways your brain processes visual information. I just want to show you this distorted image. What do you think it might be? Here's the big reveal. Put your hands up. How many thought that that was an urban environment that they were looking at? No one. Okay. Now look at this. It's been distorted. It's been equally distorted. How many of you thought it was something like a natural scene? Thank Christ for that. <laughs> Bottom up. 
What I've shown you here is that your brain is way better at reading nature than urban images. This is because our brain processes visual information in a bottom-up kind of way, starting with basic features such as edges and colours, gradually building up to more complex representations of objects and scenes. Properties of nature get processed super quickly at the early stages in the visual system and take much less cognitive load. Because of this, they evoke feelings of happiness by triggering the reward centres of your brains. The way people experience graphic rewilding flower art isn't dissimilar. Even though they are cartoonish abstractions, whimsical caricatures with bold black outlines, oversaturated colours and no perspective or background, your brain still immediately reads these images as flowers. And according to neuroaesthetic theory, generates the positive associations we've mentioned by triggering the reward centres of your brain. But why does your brain read these images as flowers with their calming and relaxing associations rather than just giant, abstract, colourful shapes? Well, this brings us back to the original video I showed you. You see, while looking at this video, with minimal visual information, your mind has quickly used the bottom-up imaging process I mentioned that also scrolled through its internal Rolodex, a lifetime of gathered intel, and decided this is a facsimile of a natural scene. The result is, I'm praying, that you're seeing a gentle bird's eye journey through a purple, misty canyon. But your modern day lifetime of collected data doesn't just incorporate nature experiences, does it? It incorporates a plethora of contemporary media from posters to artworks, advertisements, animations, logos, smartphone games, social media. Through these, and if you're familiar, the occasional David Attenborough documentary, we've had a gradual education to so many other ways of seeing mountains and canyons. In life, as humans encounter more objects and scenarios, they develop the ability to recognise an object despite variations in size, orientation, illumination, perspective and other factors. So the fact that this screensaver animation is an abstraction without sky, clouds, water or a sense of scale derived from trees or animals except the shapes, the modulating colours, the tempo of the film, even the sense of mystery as to what's around the corner, all conspire to create an overarching narrative that says landscape. And we are not only able to interpret the information, but I'm willing to bet we all derive a sense of relaxation, contemplation, and even, dare I say it, happiness from it too. So much of this talk had to be left on the cutting room floor for the sake of brevity and possible audience fatigue. But I hope I've shown you that even the simple image of a painted flower can raise profound existential questions about the effect of aesthetic experiences in the state of your mind. I'm not a scientist or an intellectual. I'm an artist, but our graphic rewilding projects are fueled by intense curiosity and a strong desire to hack people's happiness by connecting with bold images of nature at eye level. I hope this talk has sparked your interest in some of these ideas too. And next time you're having a walk in a wildflower meadow, staring mindfully at a screensaver, looking at a Van Gogh painting of sunflowers, trying on a bright floral dress, or running through the virtual forests of Red Dead Redemption 2, you'll remember this talk and possibly smile. Thank you. Well, I'm a 10% better human being after this. Thank you, Lee. And now we have a break, and if you thought it was an ordinary break or a pause, um, that's a steep misunderstanding, it's a power break. And you'll get a very upscale, designed, fancy, ugly power boost that we've designed uh, from ugly fruits this time round. Same company that made the ugly soup at lunch, remember. Uh, you have 15 minutes, please be quick, pop to the loo, Get some fresh air and I'll see you in the last session. 15 minutes. Ég heiti Addi Ólafsdóttir og ég er viðburðastjóri hjá Íslandi. Við erum að fara að flytja í Hafnafjörð innan tveggja ára. 
og með það í huga þá erum við búin að vera að fara í gegnum geymslunar hjá okkur þar sem ímislegt hefur litið dagsins ljós og þar á meðal voru tölvutöskur en málið var að renni lásinn á þeim var bílaður þannig að við áttum erfitt með að gefa þær frá okkur og þá kviknaði svo hugmynd að fá hönnuð til í raunni samstars með hugmyndir hvað væri hægt að gera. Ég er Rebekka Sleigilstóttir og ég er hönnuður. Ég geri eiginlega ekki neitt nema að sé með sjálfbarni sem leiða ljós og ég með tekið eiginlega ekki þátt í verkefnum nema að sé mikil áherst á sjálfbarni og umhverfisvitund í verkefni og svoleiðis. Verkefni var sem sagt það að fá allar þessar tölvutöskur frá Íslandir sem voru gallaðar. Það er gott að fá að vinna með svona stór fyrirtæki og þetta sína að stór fyrirtæki geti tekið þátt í því að endur nýta. Ég sem sagt byrja á því að fara bókasafnið og Ég fann alls konar svona gamla bækur, tímarit og svona skólabækur sem að Íslandi eru að nota og var að svona skoða frá sögu að Íslandi er fjöll höfðu stórst hlutverk í sögu flugs á Íslandi. Alla flugvélarnar hjá Íslandi er heita eftir fjöllum þannig að það standa mjög mikið upp úr og bara að skoða svona hæðamyndir að fjöllum og það er svona innblásturinn að þrauninni vörunni að verkinu að þetta sé svona óður til fjalla, íslverka fjalla. Ég heiti Jóhanna Harpa, Árnadóttir og er í sjálfbarni teimi Æslandi er. Hjá Æslandi er er mikill metnaði fyrir umhverfismálum og sjálfbarni og við erum meðvituð um þau áhrif sem starfsemin hefur og það er ekki eingöngu flugvila eldsneyti sem er að horfa til heldur er þetta margir þættir, það er allt sem telur. Stóllinn sem að Rebekka hefur hannað og er að sauma fyrir okkur. Hann er gott dæmi um það hvernig varningur sem að var búin að þjóna sínum tilgangi og var ekki nót fyrir, hefur nú öðlast nýtt líf. Hvað er nú, hvað er nú, hvað er nú? Segjum að þetta með upprófunumerki endan eða spurningamerki? Every way that we interact, the way that we communicate, the way that we set up our business and all the flow of those processes are also design. Já, held að þetta sé bara alltaf eitthvað svona forvitni um samtíman og pælingar um framtíðina. Má gera Það sem að vill skilur upp. Slepp að taka hann á hýbara. Slepp að taka hann á því og sjá hvað gerist og veist, við erum alveg búin að gera það núna. Hlutir, já, eru kátískir og það er eitthvað sýst sem í gangi en við skilum að það gefa það alltaf lægi. En já, mér stóð svolítið beautiful. Það er trekkið að hanna eitthvað sem að endist mjög lengi án þess að verði verði leiðigjátt líka. You know this. Sort of newness. Everything has to always be so fresh and new and kind of yeah, the fast yeah, fashion. Exactly, <laughs> it's fashion. very much exactly fast fashion in a way. Yeah, held up. Has it come? All the hunters, no, virkila, lite, á sitt ferli, hunna ferli, og taki bara ábyrð á því sem að þeir eru að gera og gera það vel. To be kind of you know agents, agents in general and agents of change is is kind of. Paramount, but it can only be done with everyone kind of on board. I think that is part of the solution is collaboration between different fields of like even within the design world mm -hmm. that we have to and you know people like collectively just work together as a whole and and that's what I would love to be there. What now is like yeah, let's get together and you know get things done.
Ég heiti Guðrún og ég er framkvæmdastjóri Krónunar. Við Krónunni okkur er mjög antum umhverfi og við viljum leita allra mögulega leiða til að lámarka sóun og endunýta það sem hægt er. Eitt sem við höfum verið að skoða og höfum verið meir sem við innleðingu núna í ákveðin tíma er deili hagkerfi okkar taktupoka skildiftipoka. Þetta gengur út af það í rauninni að viðskiptavinnur okkar geti skilið eftir poka sem mögulega hafa safnast saman heima og er ekki nýtingu og líka aðrir viðskiptavinnir sem koma að vestla geti þá gripið með þessir poka á móti. Þetta er eitthvað sem að hefur reynst okkur mjög vel en þetta hefur því miður ekki fengið alveg þá útbreyslu sem að við vildum. Þar svona kom til þessi pæling að fara í samstarf með stúti og fléttu. Getur hefna. Ég heiti Berta og við erum stúti að flétta og við erum vöruhönnir, vinnum með endurvinnslu og endurnýtingu í okkar hönnun og erum að gera, sem sagt, endurnýta gamla krónupoka og búa til nýju poka sem verða frumstindi núna á hönnuna mars. Það skiptir okkur miklu máli í krónunni að vera í góðu samstarfi við skapandi fólk og vinna með hérna öðrum fyrirtækjum sem hjálpa okkur að hugsa út fyrir ramman. Þetta eru náttúrulega bara gamli pókar sem við erum að vinna með. En við erum aðeins að lifta þeim upp með gamlum krónufánum. Þannig þeir verða allir svolítið... Þeir verða einstakir. Já. Gera það svolítið grípandi. Þannig að þú gleymir ekki pókanum næst. Þetta er eitthvað sem að við bara erum mjög spennt yfir og virkilega þakklátt fyrir þessa flottu vinnu sem að þær í Studio Fléttu hafa hjálpað okkur með. Creativity is just one single cell in my body or one oasis of ideas. The mistakes can be so inspiring and that works really well for me because I do make a lot of mistakes. Being realistic kind of breaks creative process, so it's good to park it and leave it behind a bit while you just get a flow on. I wake up excited when I have a new project and a new material that I am exploring. Iceland is small, so we have to be able to do everything. And that's probably one of the things that made working here so interesting. I've sort of become obsessed with Icelandic moves. The science much more than making ugly things pretty. What is the spirit of Iceland? Uh, yeah, it's a really difficult question because I think, does anyone know the answer? I guess the spirit of Iceland is chaos, chaos. I think for me it's, it's very obvious. It's passionate. Very positive attitude. Mm. It's exaggerated. Free styling somewhere. <laughs> there's this freedom and there's this carelessness and there's playfulness and it really allows you to explore and be curious. And I think curiosity is like my main drive. We're kind of raised within the spirit that you can do whatever you like. It's a lot of optimism. Extreme optimism. Just do it, you know. Nike. <laughs> we have to cut that out, I guess. Uh, why not attitude and just go and do it? If you want to do something, you'll just have to find a way to do it yourself. It's a massive driving force, and that's what enables me and probably more people around me to strive for goals that seem kind of unattainable. Naive. I think it's a mix of confidence and naivety, definitely both, and both works in a way, so... It's somehow imprinted in us that we just believe that things will just be fine, somehow. Something that really pushes you and makes you think that you can do anything and you just go and do it. Chaos. <laughs> Very closely related to our natural environment and the change of seasons.
catastrophic weather, erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, the wrath of the sea. I was very influenced by my walk to the volcano the other day, where you really get to experience the spirit of Iceland, really. So I think the spirit of Iceland could be a sweater that has been stained. It like had like it, it has this like crazy life of like eating hot dogs and enjoying like the crazy Sundays where you get a bit like crazy and like spill all over yourself in the wind. But it also needs some kind of menting too. But it can be fun the, the way we will build ment the spirit. <laughs> My source of creativity probably comes from archaeology and a lot of my time is spent on listening to old audio tapes, just trying to get a glimpse of something that is in the past. There's a lot in our past that can help us move forward to the future. So many creative people here to work on different creative things, so I feel like a lot of people are illustrator and a singer in a band or something. Like They usually have two different like creative jobs, So, and I think that's really important because that always like compliments the other. Island fever. We tend to forget about it, how isolated we are. I think you kind of have to leave and come back to realize what we have here. And all of a sudden you start seeing things you didn't see before. And like how the sky is always in front of you and there's this like endless amount of space. <laughs> and everybody is kind of trying to help each other out and so on. There's never too much of a distance. So if I need something in particular, I just call the CEO of whatever company if I need to get my foot in, in, in a door or if I need like a, some specific material or a machine, uh, I'm always somehow able to, to squeeze in. It's so easy. There was 4,000 students every year that graduated from textile design in the UK. Well, in Iceland, it's like 12 students every other year that graduate from textile design, so it's really like different. Being Icelandic is just like being from the world, I guess. But being in Iceland, I think that is what affects me the most, because you take in the environment, but my nationality has nothing to do with it. I would say that weather rules my life. And that translates into my designs. And nine months of the year, it's dark and it's cold. The seasons affect me more than necessarily just the weather. The dark winters can be quite difficult. But we are also like extremely optimistic about it because you kind of have to be if you are going to live here. If we can work through Icelandic weather, we can do anything. <laughs> One of the fantastic things about Iceland and working in this landscape uh, settings is that it's so versatile. You know, you drive from one part of the country to another one and the scenery just completely changes. And on top of that, you have these the sudden weather changes and you're always experiencing something new. It's all about these very simple things. Just the lava, it's the moss, it's the water. It's actually a beneficial how young design in a way is in Iceland because we are not trapped in tradition. So as a more free-spirited kind of... We are sort of creating our field as we go and... The fun thing about tradition is how you can break them. I can believe that it can be hard to break out of it, but here we are so free. We haven't been doing this for centuries and we have to come up with new solutions. The experimental and, and humor and everything is still an integral part of everything that designers in Iceland do. So everything is kind of allowed, and maybe that's our tradition, that we experiment. I try to find solutions to societal problems. If you're going to create anything, then we have to take sustainability and, and environmental factors into the mix. You can't be in our profession today without thinking about it about this in every single project. In a way, this fuels my creativity because I take something really technological and structured, like mathematical, symmetrical pattern generator, and combine it with something really natural and Icelandic, like the ink made from crowberries. I've been called 
color operating with the Red Cross and I get the sweaters they get in that have like holes or stains on them and they can't sell them. So instead of sending them away to we don't know where, um, I take them and take care of them and make them last longer because that's the most sustainable way of making sustainable fashion, I think. I focus on knitwear and I use the Icelandic wool. It's locally sourced, locally produced, locally designed, so the carbon footprint is minimum. Here in my shed, I'm uh, creating a turntable. It's made from Icelandic materials, which are quite rare. <laughs> Sustainability is really important in my process, and I think it should be important for every designer in their project. For example, with the project Bioplastic Skin, it's basically making plastic-like material out of animal hides to make uh, packaging for meat. We collaborate with various local companies, and we pick up their plastic weekly, and we uh, return the same plastic back to those companies but in different form. So we, we create new products and, and solutions from the waste plastic. People can also come here and adopt sweaters from the Red Cross if they promise to take care of them and use them. Fashion. Talking about meat consumption and the plastic waste that follows it, and it's like a platform for debate and discussion. And I think that is uh, one of the greatest tools designers have. Designers should be like a driving force for societal change. Uh, and that's maybe kind of a, a heavy burden to, to bear, but I, I feel like it's very definitely our role to, to change the outlook of, of society. Because we only have one world and everything. To me, if I was to choose a sentence or a word, it would be probably something in the line of, why not? Yeah, why not? Everything is possible. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Can we start again? No, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, I think we're good. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Chaos, definitely. Hello again. I'm sad to say that this is coming to an end. Not yet, though. We have a few pieces of gold left, which you can look forward to. I know you've all been dying to know who made this little forest here up on stage. It's the creation of designers Tanya Levy and Jökull Jónsson, along with Erla Björk and Melkorka Bjartmars. And they made it in collaboration with Kópavogur Forestry Association. Uh, they filled the stage with flora that was meant to be removed and gave it a second chance at life. And we get to enjoy it here today. And I hope you've uh, smelled the slight beautiful smell. It's like a perfume of the, of the Icelandic birch, one of my favorite smells. And I know they put a lot of effort into bringing these to life. Um, they, they pulled them out of the garbage cans and nursed them back into life. And like I say, we get to enjoy them both color and smell here today. Um, but onwards and upwards. It's the last session 
before us. And now we're going to focus on stories. Faced with a future that seems more uncertain and more open than ever, we ask who is going to create it? Can design help advance in science and technology? Should we collaborate more with bacteria? Should we can take control of a story of our future or lay back and let the bot do it? To answer these questions and tell us stories, we have in a minute Paola Antonelli, Senior Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art. But we start with Natsai Audrey Chiesa, designer, founder and CEO at Faber Futures, an award-winning agency operating at the intersection of nature, design, technology and society. And Natsai will be joined on stage by four storytellers, Tinna, Sikka, Ramona and Steinun. You're in for a treat now. Welcome on stage, Natsai. It's super lovely to be in Reykjavik, um, as always. Um, thank you so much uh, for an amazing curatorial journey today. Um, so my, my practice, my background uh, really emerged um, in a, an incredibly organic way. My um, training was in architecture um, before I sort of segued into material futures. And it was when I was exploring um, emerging technologies and what they would mean for our material world that I stumbled upon biotechnology. Um, I started talking to scientists who were um, painting a picture of emerging technologies like synthetic biology, which enable you to engineer at a molecular level um, microbial interactions that don't exist in nature, for example, um, that I started to think about the role that design can play. Uh, if we're talking about designing organisms, um, can we upstream design, as we might understand it in this audience, uh, into the lab, and what could we effect um, by doing so? So in 2018, um, I founded Faber Futures. Felt like the right time to start to introduce design um, in uh, a laboratory environment. Uh, and especially because at the time, um, the startup space, uh, people really thinking about how to industrialize biotechnology was really starting to come, in, come into its own. And for me, it felt really important that design as a discipline um, can be uh, right at the forefront of how we imagine these technologies. So today I lead a team, multidisciplinary team of um, creative direction, um, brand strategy, um, design strategy, research and architecture. Uh, and, we, and we build out our projects uh, to respond to need, um, bring in different kinds of expertise to make them happen. Our studio is really undergirded by Project CD Color. It's almost our founding project, um, a project that I started before I uh, began the company um, that brought me into immediate contact with uh, the living world in a way that I hadn't um, prior to that. As a recent graduate from Central St. Martin's Material Futures course, I started to collaborate with um, a scientist at University College London um, and Professor John Ward at the Biochem Engineering Department introduced me to this microorganism called um, Streptomyces silicolor. Streptomyces silicolor is a soil dwelling organism. Um, the smell of rain that we all like uh, is a compound that it secretes. And so it's a, it has a, a very sort of uh, strong omnipresence in, in our day to day. But in the lab, it's used for um, antibiotic research. And so John gave me this organism and he said, you know, it also produces pigment. You're a designer, that must be interesting to you. Um, and so I started to explore what it meant um, that this organism, if you grew it in the appropriate conditions, um, produced uh, this compound, this blue compound, uh, color means sky blue in Latin. Um, and actinohodin is this really gorgeous compound um, or, or molecule, and if you grow it directly onto textiles, 
it turns out that it can dye the textile in an incredibly efficient way using ambient temperature um, and very minimal resource use. And so we've been experimenting with what it means to choreograph um, and to steer the growth of this organism um, in the lab uh, and the sort of material aesthetic outcomes um, that emerge. Uh, and what it means to start to try to scale something that's happening on a Petri dish uh, to think about how it might um, emerge uh, as, a, as, a, as a garment. Um, how do you need to pattern cut in response to your working environment being a laboratory? In other words, new maxims of scale about how we think about the body and fashion start to emerge. So for me, biotechnology clearly is not about drop and replacements. It's not a, a, a scenario where we think about these technologies as producing commodities. Um, we, it gives us an opportunity to rethink how we, and especially if we bring design to the lab from the beginning, what that system could actually be um, and how we might actually approach um, what scale up looks like, uh, the opportunity for us to build new supply chains. But one of the things that has become clear for lack of this direct interface between the humanities into the sciences and engineering um, is that very few people are able to make the decisions about how we actually scale these, um, um, these, these technologies. And so it becomes imperative for us to seek new stories um, and to find strategic ways of getting them um, into the right places such that they start to inform new narratives about that possibility space. And we had the opportunity to explore that with the World Economic Forum. Um, in 2020, during the pandemic, I was invited to become a member of the Global Futures Council on Synthetic Biology, which was bringing together a group of um, quote unquote, so-called experts um, to think together about how to advance the field um, and a roadmap that the World Economic Forum could take and um, put into its network of stakeholders to actually um, bring about the kind of mobilization that is required to scale these technologies to speak to the um, challenge areas, areas of our time. And one of the key pieces of work that as a council we developed was um, trying to frame the narratives around um, synthetic biology. So, um, you know, over the last 10 years, a lot of promises have been made, a lot of promises have been broken. Where are we now and where do we want to go? And can we build a new value system that helps orient how we think about technological development um, in this field? And so Faber Futures was invited um, by the forum to develop a framework uh, of stakeholder engagement um, to articulate a new values um, that might inform the kinds of narratives we need to build um, to you know, ultimately convince different kinds of stakeholders uh, who have skin in the game to um, mobilize action around that. And what was really key for us, um, given this almost quite privileged position to curate voices from a global stage, was to in first of all, step back and to think about how we might actually design stakeholder engagement, how we might question what it is to engage uh, on a global level voices. Um, what do we do with that information? And so from the beginning, the, the World Economic Forum emphasized that we wanted to use, you know, the stakeholder engagement as a way to validate our thinking. And we said, no, stakeholder engagement is not, not to validate your assumptions. It is to cast a net wide and to synthesize um, what comes out of that. Let, how do we design an engagement where that starts to inform um, our thinking? And so everything from designing or redesigning who counts as a stakeholder um, became um, important. And so in, the, in, in most cases, when people talk about the um, multidisciplinarity of synthetic biology, uh, they tend to be talking about the, the various sciences that are involved, computational scientists, engineers, um, biologists, um, AI engineers, etc. But they're not really talking about folks who are in the grassroots. They're not really talking about the design community, the creative cultural production machine um, that, you know, helps us understand actually what does synthetic biology mean? And so it became very important for us to cast that network or that um, stakeholder map um, much wider. 
Uh, and then another problem, we're talking about synthetic biology and I have two minutes to wrap this up before we get into the next. Um, so that actually there isn't enough time to get into the nitty gritty of what is synthetic biology and definitions differ. Um, and it was very clear that actually uh, you start to minimize who's a stakeholder on the basis of whether or not they understand uh, what is the technology. So we designed this to decenter the technology, instead inviting our stakeholders um, to share in a dialogue that's driven by artifacts. So if I asked you to bring an artifact that represents your relationship with the living world, um, and uh, I asked my grandmother to do the same, you're going to have a very powerful conversation about what it means uh, to be living on this planet today in relationship with nature. And for us, that became an important um, signal as to how we might think about how, we write a, how then we write a design brief for implementing um, some of these technologies. And so you design the dialogues. It's an iterative process. You do pilot dialogues to figure out if your method is working. Um, and, then, and then you sort of see how you can scale it in different contexts. Some of them were remote. One of them, fortunately, was in person. And you're able to collect and gather different kinds of data based on um, whether or not somebody is speaking to the other dialogue participant via Zoom or in a room um, together. Um, these dialogues, uh, d uh, for us, they sort of produced a lot of data. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of words worth of um, transcripts. Um, so it became very important not just to say to F, and this is what people think, but actually find different modalities to translate um, what was said. And to do that, not to um, obscure what has been said, but to really tweak and um, generate meaning from not just one particular set of dialogues, but how that dialogue might relate to another. That's when you start to really build nuance around some of these um, values that I think we instinctively know we should build the technology about, but these dialogues start to show real-world examples of what that means in, in real terms. And so, um, we're translating these dialogues for the World Economic Forum. Um, our client wants a PDF. And so that design project for us was, and then we've got to consolidate this into a PDF report. Um, but we're designers, so we decided that the stories that we would tell would be um, translations, if you like, of the dialogues through two key artifacts. Um, sorry, I forgot to use my clicker. Um, this is a, a sort of very beautiful visual of all of the artifacts that our stakeholders brought to their conversations. Um, and again, typically not the images that you might associate with um, a discourse around synthetic biology, and yet everybody who brought their ar uh, artifacts here um, had a lot of value uh, to contribute to conversations we might have about those emergent um, technologies. And so taking um, this and packaging it into a PDF, what goes into the PDF? Some key insights. And so for us, the insight was a science fiction story. So we worked with Claire Evans, who analyzed in collaboration with uh, Dr. Melissa Sam, um, who is um, an anthropologist. Um, they analyzed um, all of the documentation together. Uh, Claire spun out a science fiction story called The Museum of Symbiosis, um, really to help us build an imaginary about the kind of world based on these stakeholder dialogues we might actually enact. Um, and um, Melissa Sam, um, she developed a dialogue synthesis using grounded theory to really pinpoint throughout all of these dialogues the thematics that um, came up, um, the, the, the figures and the actors that help us to model the kinds of behaviors that people are um, sort of evoking in their conversations um, and ultimately gives this you know, amazing summary of this is what we do with this information, this is how policymakers can actually start thinking about um, building the kinds of frameworks we need uh, to bring these technologies to light according to the priorities of these stakeholders. And so I'm very excited today to be able to share with you a snippet of Claire's story. Um, and I'm going to invite our storytellers um, who are going to join us on the stage to sort of enact um, these stories. Um, it, for me, it's very important. 
um, to be able to um, retell the stories and to, to retell them in different contexts. There's something about retelling the stories um, that makes them real and concretizes them, but that builds empathy between people in different um, um, ge geographies, and that helps us start to think about how uh, we can resonate with some of the storytelling, what makes sense here and um, what doesn't and why. So what we'll do, and we've never done this before, and I'm maybe saying this for my own purposes, <laughs> um, is we're just going to hear um, from each of our storytellers a portion of the story, and then when we're done, we'll go straight to Q&A. The main galleries. It was an unsustain unsustainable experience. Everything was global, but nothing was connected. Life persisted, but did not flourish. Eventually, it was discovered that the cosmology itself was a fault. It had, in fact, always been a fiction designed to justify the pillaging of the planets for a privileged few. This became obvious as chemistry, biology, computer science, and engineering converged into a new field called synthetic biology and humanity began to try its own hand at creating life. They edited genes, tweaked organisms, folded proteins, sequenced DNA. At first, it was more of the same, molecular, strip mining, microscopic exploitation. The benefits of the technology weren't distributed equ equitably. Those with greater access to resources and funding more handily repeated its rewards. But the organism had a strange power. They did not always do as they were told. You have wondered into the main galleries of the museum. In front of you stands a forest of white plinths, each capped with a temperature-controlled dome. The artifacts are safe here, eternally preserved. The air in each dome is continuously monitored and scrubbed clean by an army of microscopic living sensors. A skin of bioluminescence, bacteria, baths its artifacts in warm, ambient light. They look beautiful, safe in their hermetic hermetically sealed tombs. But the objects in the museum do not quite make sense to you. Why were they selected? After all, the world of before was a world of objects. There were more human-made materials on the planet than biomass. Everywhere there was a asphalt and airplanes, toothbrushes and toys. You have seen the images, pizzas stru strewn with successive tides of plastic bags, handbags lost and thrown away in dumpsters, cathedral-sized warehouses filled with everything from sh uh, shoelaces to bicycles. Plenty of objects from this area have survived into the present age, repurposed where possible into useful things. But these artifacts are different. They do not serve any purpose but to teach. The mushroom. You are standing in front of a tawny oyster mushroom when a soft voice begins to emanate from the plinth. My grandmother was over 100 years old when I knew her, and we lived in a village, the voice says, smiling with memory. We didn't have much, and our favorite time of the year was the rainy season. She would sit under a tree, and as a little girl, I would run around and collect all different types of mushrooms I could find and bring them to my grandmother. As the mushroom in front of you spins suspended in air, you listen to the voice. It is the voice of Chico Guevara, 
whose name means passion in her native Shona. It has been many centuries since Govera first learned oyster mushroom cultivation and taught it to her surrounding communities in the eastern montane forest grassland mosaic of the country once known as Zimbabwe. Three generations have passed since her work promoting the sustainable production of mushrooms transformed waste into food, income and dignity for countless people. Indeed, much has changed since she selected this mushroom for display in the Museum of Symbiosis. But you know Govera's name. Everyone does. You settle onto a hard bench and listen as she shares her grandmother's wisdom. Never close the door on the forest. Always leave a little bit of the mushroom stalk in the ground. Mushrooms do not rot. Poisonous mushrooms are just as important to the ecosystem as edible ones. Mushrooms and other living things are not individuals. They all exist, as we do, within a greater whole. Science tends to focus on the sterile version of nature, Govera's voice is saying. It's missing the gods grandmother used to bring in. It's missing the basic things, like using the right language, the language that shapes you into a respectful human being. Facing the challenges of the 21st century required a complete re-evaluation of what it meant to conduct science, what counts as scientific knowledge, and who was entitled to be a scientist. For centuries, the pursuit of science was undergirded by the Enlightenment belief that nature itself represented an archaic state from which rational man had, in the progression of history, escaped. This enabled a colonial logic differentiating the primitive from the modern. Upon this basis, European colonial societies accumulated enormous wealth and power by extracting labor and resources from the people and ecosystems they deemed primitive, often justified by science, if not explicitly in its name. When they encountered traditional knowledge systems inconsistent with this worldview, they deliberately stripped them of value. It's moving to be here in the presence of something so simple and so sacred. Listening to Govera's voice, you begin to understand why this building takes the form it does. If it were as alive, as iridescent and shape-shifting as any other building in the city, it would be impossible to appreciate the courage of the generation it commemorates, the radical hope it took to imagine, to demand, the world you take for granted today. Nothing was green then, nothing was soft, surfaces were disinfected, technology was mindless rocks polished to glassy finish. Life was potted plants and zoo animals. Life was thirsty saplings in highway medians. Life was an enzyme in a factory. Life was something to conquer and capitalize upon. Life was dying. Colonial logic persisted long beyond the fall of individual empires. In the 20th and the 21st centuries, corporations accumulated the wealth and resources of entire nations using similar patterns of domination and control. Recognizing and undoing these patterns required first relearning what traditional knowledge already taught, that humans animals and ecosystems are not mutually opposed, and then demanding a political transformation to reflect this worldview. This required imagination and effort from scholarly and activist communities around the world. But it was essential to the survival of the human species to say nothing of its fellow travelers on Earth. By combining the wisdom of traditional knowledge systems with the expansive capacities of modern science, humanity was able to experience a deeper awareness of the living world, and finally, to untether science from its extractive history. 
ancestral knowledge, Govera's grandmother's language, among many other traditions, helped humanity learn to rejoin the world. It did not exclude technology, nor did it reject scientific inquiry. It made use of technology where appropriate and grounded scientific inquiry in matters of ritual, purpose, and care. Like the spidery threads of mushroom mycelium, it formed a network beneath the surface densely interconnected, waiting to transform the poison of the intervening centuries into food. It was held by grandmothers and great-grandmothers for generations until the land was returned to its rightful owners, who were always scientists too, who brought the knowledge of deep time to bear on a changed and changing world. Mushrooms do not rot. Gavra's voice falls quiet as the light emanating from the mushroom dome slowly dims. You sit in the peace of the gallery, your unfocused gaze adrift. Another dome warms along the opposite wall, beckoning you closer. You walk diagonally across the room, and as you cut across the gallery, you see that the plinths have been planted in neat rows as crops once were. Neat corridors of white space pass your eye like marching soldiers. It's unspeakably strange, too, that people would take things away from where they come from in order to entomb them under glass. You've never seen anything like it. It lends the museum an uncanny quality, a wrongness. Everyone knows plants grow better together. The microscope. The next artifact is unlike anything you've ever seen. It's very small and fashioned from a plate of weathered brass. At the center of the plate sits a bead of glass no larger than a raindrop. Unlike the mushroom, which is ancient, this artifact is merely very old. You consult the brochure and learn that this is a microscope designed in the late 1600s by the Dutch scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek, one of only 10 in existence. Through this simple handmade lens, van Leeuwenhoek met the world's hidden actors, the panoply of single-celled organisms animating everything from pond water to dental plaque. plaque. The animalcules, as he called them, that could be found in falling rain and carried by the wind and floating alongside the dust in the air. How strange it must have been to find life hiding, hiding in air and water. To glimpse bell-shaped protists, nematodes, spirally wound algae and bacteria for the first time. To discover that the air is dense with seeds, spores and organisms. You wonder if it frightened Van Leeuwenhoek to discover that his own body was an ecosystem. Or was he overjoyed to learn that he was not one, but many? As if echoing your thoughts, the dome in front of you begins to speak. This voice is accented with a warm cadence and rolls across the room invitingly. Through the microscope, we came to release that we are much more than humans, the voice says. It is the voice of Maurizio, Maurizio Montalti, the famous designer whose fungal materials tiled the floor of your childhood home and every home you have lived in since. We are, of course, walking biotopes, complex ecosystems that result from the collaboration among many very different types of living beings, mostly tiny and not visible and not perceivable to the naked eye, he says. These are the organisms that make us human. Thank you.
That was the first time I've ever done that, so that's fun. <laughs> Hi, Natsu. Should we sit? Hi. How are you doing? Raise your hand if you're still okay. Yes! <laughs> Good. Thanks. Okay, Natsu, we just um, um, wanted to ask you maybe just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I find it extremely interesting through our conversations, you know, when we were sort of preparing for this and we're talking about storytelling as a, this very powerful tool to create futures, right? Mm -hmm. And propose some, some ways to move forward. Um, but you also spoke a lot about, uh, you know, it's not enough to tell the stories. You know, you also got to listen, mm -hmm. you know, and on that. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on, on the importance that has for you? and retelling the stories? Yeah. So, so I, I sort of alluded to it earlier um, that our client was the World Economic Forum and so um, that creates a lot of constraints, um, at least for, for our own practice, about what the deliverable is and um, for the project the, the deliverable was a PDF and so the question was how do we hack the PDF so that people like us actually <laughs> want to engage in this report um, mm. and so uh, bringing Claire in um, as a as a writer to think about this in con in, a, in a science fiction context mm -hmm. became a really important way to generate a story that um, as designers we knew that yes this is the deliverable it's done but actually we can take a story like this and you know build different kinds of experiences mm -hmm. around that and I you know this was a very uh, low intervention type of experience which is that um, I'm sure no one's going to necessarily download the PDF to read it, I encourage you to do so, it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> but in lieu of that, um, we have this opportunity to dip into the story together. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this act of retelling um, is so important because it affirms other people's narratives. Um, uh, listening to them and making space for that uh, means that we can connect with other people's um, experiences um, and, uh, and, and their relationships with the living world. And that's so important because I think one of the key challenges that we have, um, and Liam alluded to this earlier, is like how are we going to get everyone on this planet to agree <laughs> to decarbonizing mm. in, a, in a way that is um, coordinated? Uh, and for that, you do have to have empathy, you do have to have shared narratives, and us retelling each other's stories um, builds an empathy um, and understanding to understand what is at stake for me as an individual, mm -hmm. but uh, for us as a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And since you brought Liam into the conversation, would you agree with him when he says he claims that we have a crisis of imagination? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's driven by so many different um, forces, namely capitalism. <laughs> um, because actually when you evaluate all of the emerging technologies, they suffer the same um, problem, which is that the market is determining how the technology is going to be applied. And so everybody's excited about AI. There's a counter argument that it's not actually going to do anything because market logic suggests that uh, we'll just use it for more productivity and selling ads hmm. because that's all the market logic can actually. So it's really important for us to be having, um, for us to develop ways to decenter the technology and make space for um, other kinds of narratives, um, but not just make space for talking, <laughs> actually build the infrastructure that we require for people to, to work together. Mm -hmm. And that infrastructure is physical, it's buildings, right? It's institutions, um, it's funneling f funding into making it possible mm -hmm. to sustain the kind of thinking and working that now needs to happen mm -hmm. um, so that we have an end-to-end -end approach or open-ended approach that has many actors mm -hmm. working towards the thing. Yeah, we're gonna get there together. Yes. That's... In the driving driver's seat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, I'm afraid we have to conclude it here. Thank you so much for being, it's blinking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. Thank you. And especially the storytellers, Tinna, Sikka, Ramona and Steinun. It was a lovely moment. But next up is Paola Antonelli, who will be joining us digitally. She's a senior curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art, 
producer of the MoMA R&D salons and co-founder of the platform Design Emergency. And she'll be joining us on Zoom today. Welcome her digitally as well. Paula, welcome. Thank you. Wow, big. <laughs> Thank you, Thura. And so sorry, everyone, that I'm not there with you. Uh, it's because of MoMA business. I would love to be there in Reykjavik. But, you know, from here, I think it's been a wonderful conference. I've followed some bits and pieces uh, and some social media. And it was gr it's great to come right after my friend Natsai. Uh, we're talking about storytelling, and that's pretty much what I do in life. I try to sway and to bring people along because I do believe that design is the highest form of human creative expression, and I want to share it with as many people as possible. Um, of course, that's not enough to say that design is a highest form of creative expression. It's also a way to change people's behavior. It's an agent of change. You know, you've heard this many times, but I believe it profoundly, as do you. So I believe that my job is to take advantage of the platform that I have, MoMA, for instance, but also others, to try and highlight through design some of the major problems that exist in society and that's one of them today is of course the environmental crisis and the need to really think differently about the environmental crisis um i hope that you're starting to see my video right now maybe oh perfect you can see my presentation so today is the, there is always a design emergency you know it's important to really think about it that way and Everything, any kind of emergency that happens in the world is also design emergency because design is so embedded and so really, um, I didn't start my countdown, I have it now, uh, is so embedded in life. So any kind of design emergency can be approached also with design. Design by itself is not going to save the world, but it definitely can help. So um, it's funny because if we're talking about this particular emergency, which is the environmental emergency, this leads me back to the first show that I ever did at MoMA and how different it is to a show that I would make today. So the first show that I did at MoMA was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. It was 1995, because that's how long I've been at MoMA. And at that time, uh, materials had changed, had gone through a big transformation, and designers could customize the materials themselves. The new composites that could be almost molded like sculptures, the new resins that could be cured at ambient temperature, the first compounds that were trying to recycle waste. It was all a brand new world that designers could control themselves. So the first exhibition was enthusiastic about the performance of materials. It was about showing uh, objects made with new materials or objects made with old materials that behaved in a different way. You see here at the bottom right, the aerogels that at that time were a novelty and uh, people were so completely mesmerized by them that the uh, New York Times critic wrote that they were lighter than air, which of course was not true because otherwise they would be floating. But it was really all about the wonder of materials and how they performed. Today, I am preparing with my colleagues an exhibition called Life Cycles that will open in the fall that is about materials. And almost 30 years later, what we care about is not the materials performance, their advanced, their futuristic image, but rather where they come from and they went, where they will go. So it's the life cycle of materials that is really what we look into. And that makes a gigantic difference. It makes a gigantic difference and it's an accumulation of uh, culture changes, of cultural changes, and also of scientific and historical historical changes that has led us to today. And as a curator of contemporary design, I am just voicing the world through my lens. And in a way, um, there's many steps that I followed to get to this point. It's a whole career of exhibitions that always have the same kind of DNA, that of trying to help improve the state of the world. And the state of the world right now is mired in this environmental emergency. An exhibition that I did a few years ago is a prelude of sorts, or at least uh, another act in this play. It was called Broken Nature, and it was the 22nd Triennale di Milano. Milano is where I was born. No, 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 
I wasn't born there, sorry. It's where I grew up. I was born in Sardinia very proudly so, but I grew up in Milan and it's a city where citizens really love design. So I knew that it would be an exhibition for citizens. And it was about the uh, environmental crisis we're in. And it was also about our plight as a human species, but let's focus on storytelling. What I tried to do in that exhibition, together with my co-curators, my uh, team, which was a fantastic team, we tried to have three principles in mind. It was an exhibition for citizens, as I mentioned to you. We wanted everyone that came to have a sense of long time. So sometimes it's hard to think about anything that is beyond our generation or two generations, our children, our children's children's, maybe three generations from now, but it's hard otherwise to have that um, real feeling of long time. We wanted the exhibition to give people a sense of long time by looking at differences in the world in the past and in the future. Number two, we wanted people to start understanding that we need to think by systems, that you cannot have a reaction to, to any action that is just bionivocal. You have to think of the reverberations also. And the third goal that we had was to make sure that anybody that came to Broken Nature would leave with a sense of what they could do in their everyday life, something minute, nothing major, but just steps that they could take to change and to try and be more responsible and sustainable in the world. So you see here, it's about the sustainable development goals after all, you know, so you have them here designed and uh, uh, graphically rendered by the UN. But when people, citizens see this, they don't necessarily understand how to adopt these in their lives. You need to give people strategies. And that's what I try to do as a curator of contemporary design. And that's what Broken Nature tried to do. We were trying by showing different examples of design to offer our public various strategies beyond the usual recycle, reuse, uh, or, you know, uh, treat things, co-create. It was also trying to give other strategies that would make them more responsible. For instance, thinking of waste as a new material, very simple, but, you know, it needs to be, uh, there needs to be a reminder or a design with energy or increase empathy. There were all these different strategies. And what we were trying also to do was to make sure that these strategies would be um, an, an addition, a pleasant addition to people's lives, not an atonement or a punishment for past sins of all of humanity regarding the environment. These are the beautiful um, renderings. You might tell me this is even worse than the, uh, than the UN, uh, than the UN graph. No, no, it's not worse. It's very elegant. But anyway, we didn't want people to really go crazily trying to understand the graphic keys, but we wanted people to see what they could do in life to change things, right? From recycling mindfully electronic waste to eating fish that is uh, fished sustainably, all these different bits and pieces. And these are the beautiful icons by Anna Kulacek. The exhibition in itself had many different objects, but what is important when, it, when we think of waste as a new material or long time were examples of work that were almost art. For instance, this fossils of the future, the plastic glomerates that actually already exist in some uh, volcanic islands in Hawaii. It's the detritus of the plastic in the ocean that melts with the lava and forms this kind of sinister um, fossils we will find perhaps in the future. And then this beautiful picture pictures by Mandy Barker that show magnified and almost treated like old, old specimens, the plastic that we find in the ocean. There were other greatly narrative pieces in the exhibition. That's what I'm really focusing on, the narrative of design, such as the silk pavilions by Neri Oxman that are always wonderful to narrate to people because it's about building together with silkworms, so quite irresistible, or the story of the algae labs that are organized in Luma at, in Arles in France, where Jan Bolen and his team try to go around the world and teach people to use the algae that exist and proliferate everywhere there's over pollution, because, you know, it's the uh, phosphate in the water that give this kind of like over nurture to algae, try to use the algae uh, that can be found locally to transform them into bioplastics that can go back to uh, giving us 3D printing 
printed vessels and objects from the material culture of, for instance, in Istanbul or Sardinia. So all these different examples were ways to really have a narration. And also, it was a way to show objects that had a history themselves to kind of make people want to uh, think of objects as something that gets adopted in lives and not consumed. I hate that um, consumption idea. So it's almost like arguing for a new animism. Every object exists because somebody, a human, willed it into the world. So when you adopt it in your life, you have a responsibility. And you see here the work of artists that reuse damaged uh, porcelain plates or plastic plates or reuse coffee grinds and make them into new vessels. So really this history continues in many different ways. Fernando La Posse um, is a, a Mexican designer that lives, used to live in London, now he's back in Mexico, and he uses design really as a way to reseed, and this is almost literally so, um, heritage corn into, uh, into communities and using every part of the corn, including the husks, to make these beautiful objects that almost become marketry or new materials. One once again, great narrative. In the exhibition that I'm doing right now, um, that's called Life Cycles, there will be many different objects from the collection that all deal with narrative. Aranda Lash, for instance, are great um, computational architects. You know, they are among the pioneers of computational architecture. But in order to get to this computational architecture and to a material knowledge that really takes advantage of digital, uh, of digital energy and technology, they go back to Native American basket weavers that help them exploit to their uh, maximum all of these digital capabilities. So a beautiful way to bring together material stories. And instead, when it comes to the work of Re Revital Cohen and Turban Balen, it's this diamond, synthetic diamond ring that is made by burning tusks of elephants. And this is reminding of what happened in Kenya a few years ago when the government obliged all of the poachers to actually give up all of their tusks and burn them into these big bonfires that were almost a way to exercise our sins in that particular case. And in this exhibition, I will also have some new acquisitions so you can see the difference between 30 years ago. It's different, but it's the same, right? It's just a different culture. This is work by Adi Nugraha, who is uh, an Indonesian designer, who uh, decided to look around and see what was available around him. And there's a big problem with cow dung in the particular island where he lives because there's too much of it. So he found a way to use cow dung to make these beautiful objects, like shells of, of loudspeakers speakers and light. So this idea of, of working with what you have around you leads me to also the work of Vino Daniel. And you know, already I'm giving you in this short time as many narrations as, as possible. Vinu Daniel is an architect in Kerala in India. He learned from uh, Laurie Baker, who was another great architect, who was a disciple of the Mahatma Gandhi, to always try and build with what he can find within a radius of five miles from the new home. So he builds with whatever earth is available there. And if it's waste that is available, he builds with waste. But once again, it's about showing that there can be delight in responsibility. And this is beautiful architecture. And Vinu is one of the people that we um, interviewed uh, in 2020. When I say we, it's Alice Rostor and I when we started Design Emergency. So Design Emergency is another example of storytelling that does not rely on the galleries of the Museum of Modern Art, but rather started during the lockdown when both Alice and I were stuck, she in London, I in New York, and we decided to start these Instagram lives with the designers that were actually taking care, that were trying to really have an influence on the pandemic. We started out, for instance, with Alisa Eckert. You see here the uh, image of the coronavirus that you've seen everywhere. Well, the real coronavirus is that gray blob with the little dots around it. And it's Alisa and her partner at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that 
gave that branding, that designed that Hellraiser kind of image, that deep water mind that we all know with the menacing as, um, uh, as protein. So it was really an act of design. And it's an example. It was about taking the opportunity of the pandemic to explain to people what design does, right? We also had other examples of design like the haunting first page of the New York Times when the United States reached 100,000 deaths. And it was for the first time in the history of the newspaper that there was no image on the front page, only the names of the people that died. Of course, it had to continue also inside because it couldn't fit 100,000 names. So these acts of design that sometimes are about having um, a, a, an awareness campaign, uh, that's the one from New Zealand that is on the right on the right hand side, or designing valves to split ventilators, and that's an anesthesiologist from Bologna, Marco Ranieri, that took advantage of Italian uh, furniture manufacturers to design and build and produce this valve in like 48 hours. So we looked at everything we could find about the pandemic. And then we moved beyond the pandemic to the designers and architects, and we use design as a term that en encompasses everything, including architecture, to look at the designers and architects that are doing something to improve the destinies of the world. We told you about Vinu Daniel before. This is Xu Tian Tian, who's based in Beijing, but has worked with her company in these valleys, this valley of 400 villages and has worked with communities and minimal acts of design, such as just putting together bamboo to create a canopy and create a theater. These minimal acts of design that really nurture and, and, and kind of give a start, a new start to communities, to local communities. This is an example of a designer that's working towards the future. And here is an example of another act that is beneficial to the future. You're looking here at fresh kills. Fresh kills on Staten Island, which is one of the five boroughs, almost the forgotten borough, they call it, in, in New York, right? It's an island, um, was the site of one of the biggest dumps, uh, waste fills in the world, which was closed early in 2001, but was reused after 9-11 to kind of like sort all the human remains of the people that were in the World Trade Center. So really a haunted site, and that was then, this is now. So 20 years later, James Corner and Field Operations and many other uh, collaborators are transforming fresh kills into the most beautiful park, urban park, than one can imagine. This is, once again, long time. This is about thinking beyond one's lifetime, but for the lifetime of a community. And it's about regenerating and turning what you might call waste or what you might call death or what you might call uh, a cemetery into instead a place for life and for the future. Similarly, Alice and I also looked at um, the Great Green Wall of Africa. Think of the same, but on a, a, on a planetary scale from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Indian Ocean, 21 countries committing to create a ribbon of greenery at the southern, at the southern edge of the Sahel to kind of change the whole ecosystem of the world and replenish what's been taken away by the deforestation of the Amazon. So, um, uh, minimal acts, maximal acts, design really can infiltrate every single uh, part of our life. And Alice has been very, very active both on our Instagram feed and right now in our podcast, in our Design Emergency podcast. She's been very attentive also to what happens in the Ukraine. This was the very early time when uh, people were changing uh, all of the directions. This is something that happens quite often in wars and in invasions, changing the direction and sending the army the wrong way, but then the acts of architecture and design have multiplied and have become much more embedded and sophisticated. What is truly important to consider is that there is always a design emergency because the world is always in some dire strait. And when we think about design being part of the environmental crisis, that's only one and really important and underlying crisis that, because we were saying we think in systems, is also embedded in all other crises. But even when it comes to other types of crises, for instance, right now I'm thinking of the bullying, you know, online bullying or the um, amazing um, problems that are happening, for instance, with all the assaults to democracy and to uh, 
human freedoms to personal and collective freedoms, design has a really important um, role to play. And that's what I consider it my job. I don't tell people what's good and what's bad. That's not the kind of curation I do. The kind of curation that I do is to give people the tools to develop their own critical sense. And um, uh, this is becoming more and more important as we're having a hard time understanding what is true, what is real, um, you know, the encroachment of AI and all the um, different viewpoints that we're listening to are worrisome indeed, but we can count on fortitude and on, uh, uh, on human resilience and on morals and ethics if we develop them. And we need to have some optimism. As I like to say, when I organize Broken Nature, as a species, we will become extinct, for sure. We have some control over the when, and we have quite a bit of control over the how. So we can design a, a good extinction, and we can leave, we can try to leave a good legacy so that the next uh, dominating species will not remember us as complete morons. Thank you very much for this. Um, for listening to me. And now I'm ready for Q&A or discussion with this gigantic face that you see on the screen. Can you make me small? Because I kind of scare myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for this, Paula. Thank you. Uh, super interesting lecture. I wish you could have seen all the interested faces in here. Oh, that's good. And that's good. saying Thank a lot you. because they've been uh, sitting down for a long time today, taking in all sorts of information and, and inspiration. Uh, Thank unfortunately, you. we don't have time for any questions and answers. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make good. myself small. I'm trying to become smaller. <laughs> Please don't. Thank you so much so, for this inspiring thank lecture. Thank you. Thank you. All the mm -hmm. best. Uh, so this was... <clears throat> this was indeed our last lecture of the day. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. You've learned heaps and been inspired. So many wise words and, and golden sentences. Um, beauty is in the brain of the beholder. Kids are human, just worse at hiding it than adults. Uh, and design is the highest form of creative expression. Uh, not a little statement there. Um, and like I say, it's been an honor uh, and a joy to partake here today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now let's get the curator, the author and artist behind all of this, uh, Lean, up on stage and give her a warm applause. <laughs> yeah. It's been a good day. It's been a good day, yeah. I'm uh, touched and moved. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic day, yes. Um, and I think you, you summed it up a little bit, like there are golden sentences, and, and I was writing a little bit. I think what uh, surprised me a little bit was that we were talking a lot about uh, time, deep time and, you know, and uh, timelines and heritage and extinction and, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, spaces and species in sort of all sorts of, you know, different contexts and approaches. And I have to say a, a, a really a heartfelt uh, thank you to, to the speakers, you know, for really taking on this, these larger than life questions and sort of trying to disseminate them and find their way into it and uh, listening to, to my uh, sort of um, requests. I, can, I could see the faces on some of them. I mean, you would have paid actually just to see the faces of, them, of some of them when we were going over, you know, the, the session statements. They were like, okay, let's talk about life, okay? <laughs> you know, but we somehow managed to do it. And uh, the only thing between you guys and the party is us now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, should so we, we should just, shut up, maybe. Yeah. We should thank uh, Tom, who's yes. been moderating. What give a him a warm applause. Let's give him applause as well. And yeah, this has been a collaboration with uh, Business Time. And uh, it's been on the Zine magazine webpage as well and will be accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all. We just encourage you to enjoy Design March here in Iceland. It's a packed schedule, like yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and the opening ceremony starts at 5. 
go and have a party. Thank you for so the So we party and see you in 2024. Great. I respect.